So welcome to the Town of Deerfield Board of Health Select Board meeting um, for May 26th at, uh, bear with me here, at 6 p.m. Uh, tonight we're meeting um, and having our in, uh, public information session on the annual town meeting warrant um, to be held here at the, well, online uh, um, on our Zoom meeting. Um, today at 6 p.m. A brief, brief overview of the fiscal year uh, 2022 annual budget and proposed Deerfield bylaw changes for consideration by the legislative body at annual town meeting, which will be um, June 12th at 9 a.m. at Frontier uh, in the back um, area and not on the track because the track is being replaced. So meetings normally held at the municipal offices are being held remotely with adequate alternative means of public access and where required public participation provided in accordance with the governor's March 12, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 20. Meetings are typically, and tonight, are being broadcast on Frontier Community Access Television. Um, if you uh, go to, if you're watching uh, on there and you wanted to make a comment, you can call in. Uh, the number is 312-626-6799. Uh, or there's a uh, toll-free number is 833-548-0276. The meeting ID is 911-604-1580. And should you need the passcode, it's 570012. If you go to the um, town website, Deerfield um, Mass website, you can see down by our calendar on the right, there's always all of our current meetings going on. You can click the link there. That'll get you to our agenda. Then you can click on the Zoom link, which will wind up here if you want to participate that way. So um, welcome, everybody. We have members of the planning board here and um, uh, all kinds of people in involved tonight to kind of look at, at what we have going on. And I think we are the way our warrant is kind of set up normally is that we and you'll see this at town meeting. You'll see a lot of the financial stuff in, in the beginning. And then our zoning stuff is towards the back. And we, we decided to flip flop this informational session just to kind of, um, we'll go over the financial stuff as well, but we do have quite a few um, zoning changes and general bylaw changes that we're gonna be talking about at annual town meeting. We thought those would take the majority of the items. And also selfishly, our accountant and some others are at the, uh, at the um, fire districts you know, plan annual planning meeting tonight, and they should be back here in a little bit. So we thought we'd do the zoning stuff first, um, which will have again most of the conversation, and then we'll get to the the other stuff later on. So we will be um, starting with um, kind of Article Twelve, and I don't know if um, Casey, do you want to facilitate this part, or I know that Anna Lee is here and would would want to talk about some of these as well, because a lot of our uh, zoning stuff has come from the planning board as well and we we do have some some general bylaw stuff that has come out of our board and or personnel board that kind of thing so so what i'll do is i'll turn it over to annalee to start there are several zoning articles there's also um there's three general bylaw changes as well so annalee do you want to start or do you want me to do the general why don't bylaw? you start you did Casey, do you want me to share the screen? Yes, please. Um, why don't, do you want to share the screen? Do you want her to share the screen? Okay, perfect. Thank you, Jennifer. And and Casey, which would you like me to begin with? The non-financial one, right? Non-financial, do the zoning bylaw one. This is information that's also posted to the website in two different booklets mm -hmm. because we knew we had to make some adjustments in how we presented tonight. Well, we would be starting with number 12, which would be a personnel bylaw. Correct. So that, yeah, and I can start, start with there. that. Either one. Yep. So Jennifer, can you zoom a bit in on that? Yeah. All right. So this general bylaw change, personnel bylaws, chapter 35. This is to add a holiday, Juneteenth Independence Day, as was created by the governor last year, to the list of paid holidays. And this was Requ I requested, I had a conversation and requested a vote from the personnel board because according to the bylaws, they have to vote to present any personnel changes. And this one, their thoughts on this are really around 
the fact that this commemorates the end of slavery in the United States and the fact that it's really a commitment, particularly on the town's part to support dismantling systemic racism and the need to ensure freedom and equality in the US. So that was really the impetus here after the governor created the holiday itself. This would mean a paid day off, depending on how it falls, um, that would be added to our holidays list. So if you wanna skip ahead, Jennifer, the next one. This is, this is also related to holidays in the general bylaws, chapter 35. And this would be to rename Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. And the recognition in this sense is the devastating effect on the Native American tribes in this country after European expansion and colonization. And so the personnel board wanted to request the change be made legislatively for that purpose. All right, you wanna to skip to the next one? Okay, this is another general bylaw. It is the Capital Improvement Planning Committee's bylaw, chapter 10, article six, which involves the capital improvement recommendations. We had several conversations, capital improvements, myself, finance committee and the select board about the time limit that is identified in the bylaws to complete the capital budget. Generally capital planning starts the 1st of December, our budgets are all due then. And the process continues until 60 days prior to town meeting. And that's become difficult with, particularly this year and last year, with the economic conditions the town and the state and the country are facing. Because a lot of the information that we need to have and incorporate our capital spending within the budget overall budget process happens much later in the process. So the discussion with capital was to change the time frame from 60 days to, as you see here, it says two weeks. Um, it basically extends that time period that they can evaluate. And there was some discussion last night about whether two weeks is gonna be enough time, but I have had some conversations with town council and they're ongoing. Essentially, what, you, what you'll see for a request will be to make some sort of change at this point. Mm -hmm. Right, we may, you know, we talked a lot about last night maybe doing 21 days because the whole Correct. idea is that we don't get numbers from the state. We really don't know what all our budgets are. And, you know, we're still working it. We always are working it right up till the end, but, but generally, you know, you never really know what you're gonna have for capital. Um, you know, until much later in the process. And I think the idea early on a couple of years ago when this was, this was changed was to give, you know, the capital planning was going to put out a budget and give people time to kind of digest it, but it, it wound up kind of going too far. Um, and we just, you know, it was requesting a lot of work on their part because they would do all this excellent work and put a plan together. And then we never really knew what we could do until much later. And then they'd be going back and meeting and changing it. So we just, right. we thought we were kind of splitting that in the middle and maybe going to 21 days to give a little bit more time, um, you know, to do this, so. And so my conversation with council is that we may be able to make that change on the floor okay. within the motion. Yep. Um, okay, and good. so I did, if you notice, um, participants in the meeting won't know this, but I sent an email out subsequent to the meeting last night to see if Jack Davey would get in touch with me so we could coordinate that with Capitol. And the rest of the committee was blind carbon copied so they could respond to me individually okay. and not create an issue in open meeting. So that's essentially the change to the capital improvement recommendations. Yep. And this next general bylaw is intended to confirm a change to a gender neutral term that the select board made several years ago. So the request is to see if the town will vote to amend the general bylaws by deleting the word selectman anywhere it appears and inserting the term select board and further deleting the words board of selectmen each time it appears and replacing it again with the words with the word select board. The treasurer and the town administrator have submitted this request after bond council 
advised us that this formal adoption of terminology needs to be consistent so that going forward when we are bonding for larger projects like we will be for the South Deerfield wastewater treatment plant upgrades projects, that everything is, in, is uniformly termed, referred to. So the other piece of the request is to give the clerk the ability to make clerical, editorial, and other adjustments to incorporate this terminology into the bylaws. So it's really make sure that it fits in grammatically mm -hmm. and present this uniform, try to get this uniform terminology changed so that we can be able to bond with, le with fewer questions should they ever come up. There's also, so this is the first one. There is also, because the select board and Jennifer, you could pass the next one. Annalie, do you mind if I explain this one or do you oh, want to? Yeah, it's essentially the same. <laughs> it is. It's essentially the same thing. So there are two references. There are general bylaw references of the select board or board of selectmen, but then there are also zoning bylaw references. So this change has to be done concurrently in both bylaws. And as everyone might recall, zoning bylaw changes are much more strict in their notification process and requirements according to chapter 40A section five. So again, the purpose is to change the terminology so that it matches the gender neutral term the board voted in 2016 for purposes of making sure that any documentation we have to promulgate with regards to bonds or other official notations is consistent. And again, also clerical, editorial, and other adjustments to incorporate the terminology are referred to in the request to town meeting. And so the next one, here you go, Annalie, it's all you. And Annalie, if you want to share screen, just, just say something to Jennifer and she can. I share a screen. Okay. And Jen, you'll have to tell me when that's set up. Jen, can you stop sharing so Annalie can? Yep, sorry. I was just trying to get my mouse over to my second screen, sorry. There you go. You can share now. So I, ah, share screen, there we go. Yep. Okay. Um, as we do have tonight as a information session, uh, my presentation on the formula-based businesses is um, a bit longer, well, quite longer than any of my other discussions, but there certainly have been a, a lot of questions. And so <clears throat> we wanna make sure that um, as much as possible, some of those questions are answered. Um, formula based business bylaw was really created uh, in a way to attract businesses to town um, in a way that will augment the look of our town, the feel of our town, and also give a good path for um, developers to be able to follow when they come to appear before the, the planning board. Uh, the planning board does definitely want to um, be respectful of both the desires of residents that have been uh, expressed from back when we first did our master plan through the, commu the, the community um, policies that we have now for climate change and resiliency, uh, the work that we're doing in, in a lot of our areas um, to become a, a town or to stay a, a town that is very uh, true to our rural character. We also though really do want to respect businesses. Businesses have their own branding requirements, often their marketing needs. And so the, this formula-based business bylaw um, tries to balance both of those needs. Uh, for example, um, these bylaws will actually clarify requirements for developments and, and as I, developers, as I mentioned, often we do hear that developers really appreciate the more uh, detail that they can have prior to coming before a planning board so that they know exactly what we want and um, certainly want to be able to um, 
maintain our rural character. Um, an example here on the left, if you can see, um, is, a, is actually a Dunkin' Donuts, the Dunkin' Donuts in, in Haydenville. Uh, you can see that there is the, um, the logo over the over the <laughs> their arches, um, but it's obviously a very different look than the typical orange and pink Dunkin' Donuts that we're used to seeing. And this it gives you really a good pictorial of what the formula-based business bylaw is trying to accomplish. Uh, to begin with, with the formula-based business bylaw, we certainly want to be able to find what is a formula-based business. And to some degree, you can really think of it as a chain store, uh, be it a restaurant or, or a retail store. Um, but there are some very specific criteria. Um, there have to be at least 10 uh, stores in this chain. If it's fewer than 10, then the developer who is coming to our town does not think about our formula-based business bylaws. And there are other features that are in the bylaw that really talk about standardization. So is there a standard sign, facade, color scheme, uh, decor? And um, these are the criteria that make it really fairly objective for the, for the planning board to determine whether or not a, a business is in fact considered a chain store or a formula-based business. We want to emphasize this, that this does not apply to consumer services. Um, so for example, um, formula-based business would be seen as to be a dress barn, a tire warehouse, you know, they sell stuff. While maybe Bay State Medical Practice or a Jiffy Loop, they provide a service. So uh, this, this bylaw does not uh, pertain to banks, tax preparers, those sorts of businesses that provide a service rather than sell goods or foods. <laughs> it's also important to note that it applies only in our commercially zoned C1 and C2 areas, but not the northernmost C2 district. So as you'll see from the map, <clears throat> as much as you can see, the orange and red uh, primarily is along the 510 corridor. Um, and then here is our northernmost C2 district. So down here is where the formula-based business bylaw would, um, would pertain to the development, uh, but not up in that area. Um, if in fact a business is deemed to be a chain store, a formula-based business, then we ask the developer to, to work with the planning board in three primary areas. And all of these have to do with the external appearance of the building. Again, this ties into wanting to have businesses that come to our town and fit in with the rural nature of our town. So we're really only concerned with what happens on the outside. And that happened that God, the signage, the color scheme, those are the three, the three areas that we will ask for the developer to, to work with us on. So for example, um, here is a McDonald's that is in the field of walk up for tomorrow, of course. Uh, so okay. Whoever's out. talking. Other than the breeze out of the Northwest, it's actually going to be really, really nice, especially the early evening. Once we get past sunset, it will get a little cool. And then for Friday, All right. somebody's evening, talking. Can somebody mute their There we go. Thank I think we're set now. Thank you, muter. Um, so as you can see, here's a McDonald's. No. Um, as much as you can tell from the photograph, here's their typical arrow that points you into the drive through Here's their sign with their golden arches. Um, it is all seen very well from the street so that business can come in. But it's obviously very different from our usual look of a McDonald's. Here is another example of a formula-based Walmart. Um, we can see they have their traditional logo, their, uh, their font that they use, the entrances that uh, guide people into the part of the Walmart where they need to do their shopping. Um, but again, that's quite different from the typical box store um, that, we, that we usually see. Um, 
it's really important as we in Deerfield try to think of development and of course wanting to have good economic development, but it's also um, very attractive to the current stores and our current residents um, as well as potentially to, uh, to developers that they can use existing buildings um, rather than taking up our valuable uh, farmland and our wonderful <laughs> town here. Um, so by using existing buildings, certainly our most recent um, exciting example of that is that unique businesses then can come to town. Um, and many of these unique businesses such as Treehouse uh, would not fall under the formula-based business bylaw. Primarily Treehouse is the example. They don't have 10 or more, 10 or more um, sites. Um, <clears throat> the other really important thing that um, a lot of people have mentioned <clears throat> is advantageous for the formula-based business bylaw is that the multiplier effect, that when you have an opportunity for a town to have local businesses, hire local people, and then in fact, as, as, as consumers come and take advantage of that business, the money stays in the town. It becomes part of the growing economic base of the town rather than going to some corporate office in California or Switzerland or <laughs> wherever that might be. Um, this multiplier effect is, is one of the big advantages that people have, have talked with me about. Dennis, Massachusetts, and in fact, as you'll hear in a moment, the Cape in general um, is a really good example of some very successful um, use of formula-based business bylaws. Um, they enacted their formula-based formula business bylaw in 2008. And since then, a number, as you can see from this list, a number of uh, typical chain stores, if you will, or you know, more international actually stores, um, do have come into to Dennis. Um, and in fact, the thing that's been very interesting about this is Christie's, which is a, a, a um, sort of like a, a you know, gas station convenience store, I guess, and Dollar Tree felt so positive about the formula-based business branding opportunity that they have chosen to, uh, when, when possible, either with building or renovating, to change their other stores along the Cape. So they've actually seen formula-based business um, uh, regulations as being advantageous to them. And I'll say as an aside that their form uh, the, the, the Dennis and the Cape formula-based business bylaws um, are much more stringent than what the bylaws are that we're um, talking about. The ones in Dennis talk about uh, or really address what goes on inside the store and we really are only concerned with the exterior. Um, here are some quotes from some of the, uh, the planners and the people who have been in, in the front lines of uh, the formula-based business in Dennis. And um, I think it really is important to, to really emphasize that um, the reputation of a building of a business is really what draws customers and, and um, repeat customers, um, not necessarily if they're pink and red in their color scheme. Um, we, we do really feel that, I mean, it, as, as many of you know, I, I wasn't here at the time, but a number of years ago, uh, Deerfield was very forward thinking in, um, in making some bylaws that restricted uh, drive through food service. And that truly was very forward thinking. I'm sure that and it was not without controversy, um, but it was passed. And um, this is the opportunity that uh, we're seeing now for the town to um, really have, have, have one good chance. Uh, or, or a good chance right now to make a difference on how our town will look um, really for generations to come. And I guess I turn it back to Casey and uh, it sounds like we're going through a lot of the, um, we're going through the, the whole warrant. So Casey, I don't know if you want so to- we'll continue with the bylaws unless there's an issue. 
Okay, Solar, is that next? I believe. I Wanted? believe so. Are oh, we planning okay. to discuss each of these items at the end of the uh, end of the presentation? You know, take questions from constituents and. Why don't you take questions on this if if anybody has any, Annalie? Okay. While while it's fre while your presentation presentation is okay. fresh. Sure. I have a suggestion. Um, that Annalie's presentation didn't have some of the charts that are in what you put in the warrant. Casey, if we could share the screen again and go through those, it's up to you. Give me a second. Technical as, difficulty. As I, mean, Jen, I can share. Yeah, as Jen is pulling that up, what she will be showing with you is um, one of the charts actually um, it helps tie into those definitions that we talked about. Um, there are, I believe, six, here it is, um, areas that um, we, the planning board will evaluate as to whether or not a business that has 10 or more sites um, would uh, fall under our formula-based business bylaw. So as you can see on the left, it's food service. On the right is retail. And if, um, if there are 10, and, 10 or more businesses and um, there are, uh, I believe, is it standardized, air, um, standardized offerings such as um, a menu, uh, the decor and color scheme, um, a standard facade, standard signage. Um, so these, and they're fairly similar on both sides of the, um, of the screen. Um, those are the criteria upon which the, um, the business would be deemed a formula-based business. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll speak a little bit. I think um, it's I think it's been known that I'm not in favor of this bylaw. I think it's it steps too far under the controlling of um, businesses that may want to come to town. And I've had you know conversations back and forth with proponents, and um, I ju I just feel um, I understand the reason why this is coming about. Um, you know, we've all been in turmoil for two years. Um, and, and this is a lot of the reason why this, this bylaw is here. Um, and it is to control the way our character of the town looks. And I, I, I get that. I understand, you know, this Walmart looks very beautiful and the other one is not attractive. And I think, you know, I think we can achieve that by not overstepping. And I think this, this bylaw truly oversteps that line quite a bit. Um, I mean, it, it, what I've learned about being a select board member for the last four or five years is, is that is the unintended consequences of your votes and, and the decisions you make. Um, and I think, um, you know, the, the, the Dunkin' Donuts you showed in the, in the initial picture was done in a town that doesn't have this bylaw in place. And it was done through smart planning and, and some, um, you know, attentive planning boards and, and, and maybe some adjustments to the, to the bylaws of, of town. But this to me, it uh, just feels too much like um, we're not a business friendly community. We will die as a town without economic development. And I think that, you know, when, when you take, you know, you gotta have less than 10 stores to not be wrapped up into this. Um, you know, tr treehouse, they're, they're expanding. If they had four or five more places, um, you know, before they decided to come to Deerfield and they saw this, would they come? You know, I, I just, I worry about the unintended consequences of, of making it so difficult to develop in a town um, or, or making it seem that we are business unfriendly with the, um, you know, trademark or service can't be there, the, you know, a defined word phrase, the look of the building, you know, I, I think of my business, I sell windows. We have more than 10 businesses across the, 
across the town, uh, across the country and world. And, and if, if uh, my business wanted to come and open a store here, you know, we invest a lot and there's immense, immense amount of competition um, just in say the window market. And so we invest heavily in the way our sign looks, the way we look, what we sell, how the store looks and to require um, say our business, which would be very ben beneficial for the town um, to have to change its facade and not be somewhat recognizable um, in every way possible. Um, I, I just think it's a detriment. Um, I think, again, I'm not uh, opposed to the reason why we're doing this. I think it oversteps it. So um, that's just my two cents. Can anybody hear me? Am uh, I on? Yes, but Ms. Lily Dwight has her hand up. Uh, so maybe, Lily, if you could unmute. Okay, I'd like to. Hi, thanks, Lily Dwight, South Mill River Road. Um, I think that maybe you're looking at it from the wrong end of the binoculars because the town of Dennis that this is modeled on, their tax rate is less than half of ours, close to a third of ours. And their median income is significantly less than those of our town. And they clearly have no problem with very large chains coming in like Christie's and 7-Eleven. They've found a way to be there. And those companies have actually realized that it's better for them and they change their look to match the neighborhood. Um, looking more closely, Hadley, right? Hadley, which took their Route 9, which used to look like our Route 5, and they covered it in pavement and they covered it in chain stores and their tax rate is still double that of Dennis's. And if you think about it right now, they're going to be looking at a lot of empty storefronts and a lot of pavement. So I believe that the data actually show us that businesses that want to come into a town like ours are happy to know what is it going to take to do it if they only have to change three elements and be here and succeed then they fit the character of the town and then maybe our property tax rates can go down to be more like Dennis's because what I'm saying is the data show that towns that have a formula based business bylaw um, which Hadley does not apparently um, have a much better tax rate than those who don't. Thank you. Absolutely. I think Bruce's iPad and then Carolyn, if, if Bruce is still, oh, oh. no? Yes, yes I'm, 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 I wasn't sure I was on. Okay, I, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I have, would have to agree with uh, 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 Trevor on a couple of points. And um, I think the thing that's being missed is Dennis has a very low tax rate and a lower uh, um, per capita income for two reasons. One, Dennis's economy is pretty much based on services, which is based on tourism. The tourism factor is why their uh, tax rate is so low. Uh, I would like to see uh, uh, some comparisons for some towns that are a lot closer than Dennis uh, and that depend on uh, no tourism. We have Yankee Candle, yes, but the uh, majority of those people come in and uh, on their way to Vermont or, or uh, by the bus or one thing or another. Uh, I would like to see a comparison uh, that of towns a lot closer than Dennis in Western Mass that have the same results as Dennis, because I don't think you can find them there. But there again, the same thing holds true. Those couple statements by the planning board uh, from Dennis is the same thing. They have a market of, they have a ton of consumers there passing through there every day of the week, all summer long, from early spring in, in early spring and into late fall. And these people are all the time stopping. We don't have that. Our center of town for the most part is on the side of the uh, uh, town center, you might say. 
So what goes on is going to be up the Route 5 corridor. Now, turning around and telling all these stores that the only place they can, if they want to maintain their presence as is, the only place they can build is in the northern part of uh, Deerfield, that's not going to entice them. Their market will be the offspring, uh, the uh, customer that wants to research right around town uh, within the Butterfly Museum uh, distance the uh, couple of farm stands, a lot of people uh, have the farm stands, especially Atlas and so forth. Uh, that's where the consumer base is. It's not the north end of Greenfield. People are already getting tired of Deerfield by the time they get up there. They'll go up to Deerfield Academy, uh, uh, historic Deerfield, and uh, Prowl's there. They're a very interesting place. But um, they're, it's not where the businesses want to be is on the north end of Greenfield. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn? Um, I just want to say that I actually do support this um, bylaw uh, change because um, we are a destination. Yankee Candle um, is the number two destination in Massachusetts, tourist destination. And now with Treehouse, we have a corridor that will be, um, have, be heavily tourist. And I, I feel like we need to take care of um, how our community looks to enhance what businesses are already here and um, our tax base in the future. And having been on the planning board for um, almost 20 years uh, prior to my being on the select board, um, having these tools in your toolbox, you can always waiver any, everything uh, and, and negotiate with a, a developer. But if you never have the tools and they're never in your toolbox, you have no ability or no um, nothing to negotiate with. So I feel like it is important to, to give the planning board some ability to um, uh, have impact on what businesses look like in the community. Thank you, Carolyn. Jen, do you see any other uh, hands up? I don't. Jeff Upton, I have my hand up. Oh, I don't see it, Jeff. Sorry. Holly Starks had her hand up as well. Hold on, let me unshare my screen and then I can see. Okay, so I have Jeff Upton and Tolly Stark. So Jeff, why don't you go ahead? No, Tolly can go first. Okay, Tolly, go ahead. <laughs> no, that's fine, Jeff. You were you piped in before I did. Go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, to start off with. I concur with with Trevor 100%. Uh, I don't think it's fair to even try to do a comparison with Dennis. And as Bruce pointed out, I spent 50 years on the Cape back and forth. And, and uh, I know a lot of people on the Cape. And the only reason why taxes are down on the Cape is because of the tourism trade, which we don't have like the Cape does. So we can't be comparing comparing those. Uh, as far as what Carolyn just referred to, well, tools and toolbox and the planning committee uh, can, the planning board can negotiate oh, in that. Uh, to start off with, also they're talking waivers. So are we going to have a planning board? Are we going to have a planning board that uh, will not implement this bylaw consistently across every application. It depends on who the applicant is as far as whether they waive something or not. That's trouble. That's lawsuits. That puts the town in, in a dangerous position. Also, I would also like to know why we're even doing this. There's usually a cause and effect. Are we really doing this whole bylaw all the way through because of Dollar General and we have people upset with Dollar General coming into town? Is that why we're doing this? We're gonna change our bylaws that have worked for years and years and years because one business comes to town and stirs the pot. I think there's a different approach that we could use that would be uh, a, a lot less uh, invasive because right now I see this whole bylaw as trying to micromanage uh, 
property and businesses and anti-business is what we're going to have for a uh, reputation. So is this the cause and effect? Is this what it's all about? And also, I'd like to know who's behind all this uh, bylaw. Who, who wrote the bylaw? Did the planning board write the bylaw? Uh, the initial bylaw, actually. Uh, is, is, Chris Curtis, is Chris Curtis involved? And is there a stipend involved for this bylaw? Also, we talk about businesses. So what you're saying to me is a business more than 10, 10 uh, properties. So that means that we can't have a, ta a Target come in, a TJ Maxx, a Marshall, a Staples, a Big Y, a Stop and Shop. And why we're at it, what happens if Yankee Candle, Yankee Candle wants to open up a nice little re retail store uh, in town. They won't be able to because they have more than 10 businesses. Subway, Circle K, you can go on and on and on on businesses that wouldn't be allowed to come into this town. And well, that's going to affect, that's going to, let me, let me finish. That's going to affect your tax rate. When you start playing with, with businesses, you're going to put so many restrictions on these businesses that they're not going to want to come to town. And when you do that, coming from a, 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 a finance committee point of view, we have three ways of getting money to support our budget and to make this town go. One is through gifts and grants, which come and go. Two, these are the main, main items. Two is new growth revenue that helps immensely. And three is the taxpayer property taxes. If you take away one or two of those items, there's no way you're going to be able to lower your property taxes. Our property taxes are going to go sky high, and they're already high enough. You're paying around sixteen thousand now. If you get so restrictive and don't let these businesses come into town, somebody's going to make up that difference as far as money, and that's the property taxes. Now I know some people in town don't pay property taxes. But there's a lot of people in town that do pay property taxes. And there's a lot of seniors that are getting to the point where they can't afford the property taxes. That's why I have for now. Thank you. I will have further comments if allowed. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, so tall, <clears throat> excuse me, Tolly, you want to speak now? Yes, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. Tolly Stark. I'm also chair for Deerfield for Responsible Development. Um, thank you everyone for bringing up these questions, these concerns. I think this is all really great feedback and information for the planning board as they put forth these formula business-based bylaws. Um, I just wanna start by um, kind of going on some of the stuff that Trevor said, because I think those are some really great concerns that Trevor was bringing up. And um, I know myself looking at this bylaw was definitely concerned because Deerfield does need economic development. And that's very important to everyone that I've spoken to. Um, but, you know, for something such as say Pella Window, um, Pella Window, I believe doesn't have a standardized facade for all of their stores. Um, this bylaw, as far as I understand it, essentially is not saying that if you have 10 or more stores, you can't come to Deerfield. It's saying if you fit a certain definition and criteria of a standardized chain store and you have more than 10 of them, then you would then have to go through the process with these um, basically three changes of design element on the exterior, which basically allows the building to be within the keeping of Deerfield and within the character that we have already. We currently do have um, bylaws that in our site plan review address character, but we don't really have um, anywhere to guide developers or new businesses as to what that is. This gives them clear guidance. It gives a real tool to the planning board to say, you have the standardized facade 
This doesn't look like a New England, um, you know, business that's in keeping with Deerfield or, you know, like the businesses next door to Atlas Farm Store or something to that effect. So essentially, um, we would love to have you come into Deerfield. These are three changes that you could make to fit into Deerfield. And I know Trevor brought up like the Dunkin' Donuts in Haydenville. And I just want to say, as far as I know, that process to get them to have that building within a certain aesthetic was like pulling teeth because no one knew that that was expected because they did not have a formula-based business bylaw. So what this essentially does, this does not in any way prohibit any business. This actually creates a clear path for developers and businesses to come into Deerfield. This is actually a pro-business bylaw. Now, I looked around and tried to see if there were any places that had formula-based businesses and or similar restrictions because they were historical areas such as Woodbury, Connecticut, and to see if they ever had any difficulty with economic development. I have found no data to support that. And I know it's a natural way of thinking about it, but there's no evidence to that. Um, there is evidence and data, however, to say that formula-based business bylaws actually do allow good economic development. They do foster it. And as Christie's did out on the Cape, they learned that, oh, if we make these little changes, this is almost novel and people are more interested in coming to our store. So they actually took that as a form of new branding and ran with it out on the Cape because they actually saw a benefit to it. Um, and to address some of the things that Jeff was saying about why do we have this proposed formula-based bylaw amendment coming through the planning board for our town? Is this a reaction to the dollar general situation? And I just wanna say that um, I think, Jeff, I think you've been around for a while. So I have a lot of other folks that I see names on here. You may recall many, many years ago, long before the developers for jo Dollar General even looked at Deerfield, the planning board picked up a very similar formula-based bylaw. Um, I've seen some of that work that they did. They weren't quite sure how to implement it. Um, it seemed very novel at the time. So this is something that's actually been ruminating and on the table for quite a long time in Deerfield. Um, I would say this is in no way a re reactionary bylaw. This is more of saying, oh, now we've had an adverse experience with a very aggressive developer that could already have been in Deerfield if they were willing to meet our site plan review and change a few things. But instead, it's turned into something that's been very heavily negotiated. If the planning board had more tools to do that negotiation and to say, this is what's expected, they would come to the table prepared and ready. That is pro-business. When you jerk a business back and forth all the time and aren't clear about it, that is anti-business. If you tell them upfront in your bylaw what's expected, then they know that and then they can use that. So this is something that Deerfield's been working on for a very, very long time. Um, and I just wanna say that I really love that everyone is concerned about the economic development piece because that is so important, but there has been just no data at all to show that a formula-based business bylaw is going to stymie economic development. And again, this is just a definition to be clear on what a formula-based business is. And then the number that you have to say, if you're in this definition of the standardization, you have 10 or more stores, you're a chain store essentially. And so then you would adhere to those um, bylaws. So basically there's no way to ever say to any business chain or otherwise that you can't come to Deerfield. That's illegal, that's not even an option to do. It's simply saying we want you in Deerfield but we want you to be in keeping with Deerfield's character because we want unique businesses as well like Treehouse Brewing Company to come to Deerfield. If you go to Treehouse's website and you look at their press release, Treehouse chose Deerfield because of how beautiful it was, because of its rural character. Now, if you go and put in some developments across the way that are just these box store cookie cutter across from Treehouse, how is that going to affect their business? Are we gonna attract places like Treehouse at that point? As Trevor was saying, he was concerned Treehouse wouldn't come if we had this. But actually, I think that Treehouse is here because of the way Deerfield is. So let's keep it that way. And that's truly the heart and soul of this bylaw. And I really hope that folks can see that tonight. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Holly. I'm just interrupting because we have 
lots of hands raised and I just want to give everybody the opportunity to say something. Thank right. you. Your I think if we can have people who haven't spoken yet and then I'll have to defer to Casey about the timing. Um, certainly this is a wonderful opportunity for us to learn more about um, different points of view. So I don't want to cut off discussion if we um, uh, prematurely, but we do have a limited evening. So um, maybe the few people who have not spoken so far and then Casey, you can um, let us know. I think that would be a good idea. So those of you that haven't spoken, Jennifer, do you know what order they were in? I saw some of them. I, do. So, I think Julie had her hand up. Well, let me let me go through it because I can see who, who said what first. Okay. You did mention that Kip had his rain his hand raised, but it went away. So Kip, do you have something to say? Need to unmute. I'll unmute him. There. Kip, go ahead. Whoops, he Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I agree a lot with Jeff and Trevor. Um, I believe that I've heard some conversations about this attracts businesses and I couldn't disagree more. Um, I've been involved with retail for 40 years and in construction for nearly 50. Um, and some of the comments that were recently made about the Dollar General, although maybe I'm not a fan of it. The mess that we're in now is directly caused by the planning board. Um, the planning board did not do their job properly. And uh, I'll be, I'll go right out there and say the mob was, I mean, the planning board was influenced by the group of people that were at most of the meetings. Uh, but anyways, getting back to this formula-based business, it seems to me that it's, addressed toward restaurants and retail spaces. But so you couldn't have a Chevrolet dealership on one side of Route 5 and 10, but you could have a Jiffy Lube because a Jiffy Lube is a service business. You couldn't have a CVS because that's a retail space, but you could have a Mary Maids or an H&R Block or an Aspen Dental or a lot of other you know, things. So this doesn't really prevent any franchise business or trademark business come, it's a discriminatory bylaw that only discriminates against retail and restaurants. And when Carolyn had mentioned about, well, the planning board needs more tools. Well, in a way that might be a good thought, but what happens is when you give boards that type of open-end authority, they start to say, in its nature, some members might like one thing over the other. So they say, okay, we'll accept this, or no, I don't like that. And then your decisions become arbitrary and capricious. And that's when you get sued. And there's gonna be a long line of lawsuits. Now, about 25 years ago, I started a small candle business. Now who in their right mind would start a candle business in Deerfield, right? But me. And so I went out of town and I did it. And you know, the last store I built was here in Deerfield and it was my 12th store. If this bylaw existed, it would have been very difficult because I had a sign that was trademarked. I had all kinds of trade dress uh, apparel in the car, in the store. You know, the buildings didn't look a lot because a lot of them were in malls, but the sign, the bags, and everything else that identified with my business was the same. And to, to show you, I mean, when I built the building in Deerfield, I actually built a small stone wall that was two feet high. And I just planted flowers to make up the letters NEC for New England Candle. And you know what? The town shut me down because they didn't like that I had an additional sign. I said, their flowers are going to die in November. Didn't matter. I got a letter from the town, a cease and desist of using the second sign. So, you know, I've been around town for 40 something years and I've seen a lot of changes and I've never seen anything like this. And some of the other comments that were recently made, the planning boards have not been working on this type of thing. Uh, our bylaws are kind of messy and they do need to be cleaned up a lot, but this is a very bad one that's just gonna lead 
to drive a lot of potential businesses out of town. And the ones that do want to come here, they're going to sue us over it and we're going to spend a lot of money. Um, I'm sure I'm going to have more comments as we go along, but I'm through for now. Thank you. Thank you, Pip. So Jennifer Remillard, please. Thank you, Jen. Um, so I'm speaking as both a resident and who is someone who is an alternate on the ZBA, uh, who, who's observing the challenges that are coming before the ZBA and some of the concerns that exist, you know, through the planning board prior to applicants coming. And I'm not referring to Dollar General because I wasn't there during that time. I'm referring to places like Whitney Hill and some other ventures that are currently um, approved. If this bylaw is passed, it creates a uniformity amongst new businesses coming in. The people that I hear complaining or being the most vocal against it have been in business for 40, 50 years. Well, the economy is changing. New businesses are developing. Um, I have an MBA. I've seen and done research studies where bringing uniformity, having consistency, where businesses can see what is required of them makes it easier for when businesses want to come to our community. We have a mass amounts of vacant buildings in multiple locations on 5 and 10 in the downtown area of South Deerfield. And a recent proposal by someone um, regarding a property in downtown or South Deerfield in the center, they were talking about, does, is it detrimental? Is it beneficial? And it's enhancing the, um, the particular building. My concerns are Deerfield needs to come forward. We are in 2020. We need to have consistent bylaws, consistent formatting. We need to have clear and concise requirements for businesses to come in. Uh, the ZBA is currently looking at revamping its application process to streamline it. I'm working with Alex on that. But so many other communities have much more regulations than Deerfield. And I'm not talking about just Dennis, I'm talking about local communities in Western Massachusetts who have certain um, uniform requirements. It's pro-business. It's something that a business would look at and go, this community cares about what comes to their community. They're not just, you know, and most of the plans that are designed and drawn and created through architecture are for, for businesses that are considered franchises or owned by larger corporations, such as a Dunkin' Donuts franchise or any of the other ones. It's in their contracts as to how the design work usually goes. But if those local communities ask for and require different modifications, that is an easy process that can be done. Um, Deerfield needs to come forward. It needs to move into 2020. It needs to embrace its historic value. Um, I believe the, uh, sorry, Carolyn, I'm going to get it wrong, but 20 years ago, you guys wrote um, a plan moving forward with the strategic plan with Deerfield. And a lot of various things, you know, were really mentioned in there. And it would be really wonderful to see this community rally amongst positive changes within our community instead of being negative. Um, instead of complaining, take action, get involved, make those changes and, and do something positive about it. It's about bringing business here. So our taxes and I am a residential taxpayer in this community. Um, and there are a lot of people who can't afford it. But if you go to Northampton, Taxes there kept going up because of two and a half proposition overrides. Lived in Northampton for 14 years. There were five, four, four or five different ones that went to vote and only a certain mm -hmm. amount that passed. But that is an avenue that the town of Selectmen could go forward if need be at some point in the future if that happens. But we're not at that point. We can make positive changes. So that way when a business comes to the community, they're aware of what we are looking for as a community. Um, to, to piggyback on what Tali said about Treehouse, it's really well written on their website as to what they liked about coming here. We're at the foothill of the Berkshires going up to Conway. Um, and keeping with consistency, 
makes businesses understand what we're looking at. It prevents lawsuits because you're not grandfathering or you're not requiring businesses that already exist to make these uniform changes. They're for new businesses if I'm understanding the bylaw correctly. Um, and that's really important. So it's to shape our community as Lori has commented in the chat box, but it's really to move us forward in a positive manner so that we can attract businesses who like uniqueness. Um, and to do things like that. And if you're not happy with this proposal, I suggest you volunteer and you get somewhere and you make a proposed bylaw that you can bring forward at another time instead of just critiquing the positive changes that the community members are trying to make. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Jennifer. Trevor, you're next. I think we were going to, I mean, I certainly want to hear more from Trevor, but we were going to try to have people who have not spoken yet. Annette and Julie I should go I was trying first. to speak, but I don't have any video on my computer right now for some okay. bizarre reason. It's Greg okay. Franceschi. Okay, Greg. Greg, there are two people ahead of you. We have That's Annette. Fine. I just wanted to get on the queue. You're on the queue. Thanks, Greg. So Annette, would you like to go? Annette, you need to uh, unmute. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Um, I've been listening and I guess I have to feel like uh, there are two camps. And I have to say, coming through this pandemic, there's been so much change going on in our world. And it makes it very clear that we have to do things in a different way in order to look, have a future for our town, for the people in town, for the children everybody moving into the future. And this law, which someone said is very invasive, seems to me the opposite of invasive. There is three parts to it. It's very simple. It gives a heads up to businesses and that's very friendly because it lets them know, I wanna to come to town. This is what the town is expecting. I'm gonna to go to the planning board and, and they will work with us. If, if Pella wants to come to Deerfield, they could do the same thing. No one is being said you cannot come to Deerfield or to the playing board. It opens it up and it creates a partnership between businesses and the community. And what I see is that business has been so busy dictating everything and, uh, and all this, what we've heard tonight is a lot of negative things that can happen if this bylaw passes. And it, to me, it's, it's the opposite. It's very simple. It's not even complicated. It's simply a heads up to businesses. Welcome to our town. Let's shake hands. It's a win-win for business and for the community. And that's the way it should be because we want businesses that are community oriented to work together, to be together, to be part of a community. Like Yankee Candle has been part of the community. Like that Atlantic Furniture, look what they did with their building. It's, 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 it's a large building. It's very, it's, it's beautiful and they're, they're community oriented. Um, everything that Jennifer said, I, I have to say, we have to think about the future. And the future is starting with not a big, long, complicated bylaw. This is actually extremely simple. It's laid out, it's very clear, and it's not anti anything. It's actually informative to anybody coming into our town. And I, I propose that I, I am for it and I will be speaking up to my friends about it because I really think we have to move into the future. I know that this was talked about. I heard in our town in 2008, it was never acted on. Lots of towns have put laws, as was said, lot complicated or simple laws. We need this, we need this to, to, for our town. And it's simple. There's nothing complicated about this, it's clear. So that's all I have to say. Annette, thank you. Julie? Hi. Um, so kind of to follow up on what you just said, when I read the very simple bylaw, what I read is that within all C1 and C2 commercial zoning districts, excepting the most northerly one, which I don't know why it's excluded, formula-based businesses that conform to definitional, definitional elements four, five, or six. So that is four is a standardized facade, five is standardized decor and color scheme, and six is standardized signage. Herein are prohibited. So all it says is they're prohibited. It doesn't say work with us to make your facade and paint scheme happier or whatever. It, it doesn't say, it just says they're prohibited. So the way I read the bylaw 
it very clearly says that they are not welcome in Deerfield. And that makes me pretty uncomfortable. Um, Deerfield has a lot of momentum right now. There are a lot of ideas out there for things. Well, the sewer plant is already moving forward, which is very much needed. There's ideas for improving the senior center, senior housing, library. There's a whole bunch of things that people want to do, all of which are going to take money. And we need businesses in our town. Otherwise, it's all going to fall on the taxpayer. Um, so this, the, the way I read it, it looks very business unfriendly and um, not like it's working with businesses. That's all. Thanks. Thank you, Julie. So Kate Lawless. Hi, everyone. Hi, good David evening. Here with me. He wants to go first. Well, I'll go quickly and then I'll let Kate speak. So with, with the possible exception and the definite exception of Julie's uh, comments, you know, and, and actually let me back up and say, I haven't made up my own mind about the bylaw, but with the exception of Julie's comments and maybe some others, uh, I'm concerned that most of the opposition I've heard isn't to this specific bylaw, it's to planning. And I think, whether or not you like this specific bylaw, I just want to sort of raise my hand and say, I think we do need some real planning in this town. It has a character that we all appreciate. We don't want that to get lost. Nobody wants a Chevrolet dealership across the street from their house or, you know, in it placed in such a way that it's going to drive down their property values. We're all concerned about business development. It is important. We're all concerned about our taxes. But we also need to be concerned about our property values. And I think good planning can balance both objectives. And, and I just want to make a plea for planning here. Uh, the, the other thing, just quickly, I do want to echo that I do think, and it may not be this bylaw, but bylaws like this one that provide certainty to businesses are not business unfriendly. Businesses hate uncertainty. Businesses hate going before a board and not knowing what the outcome is going to be, not knowing what the process is going to be, not knowing what they're looking at. So I, again, I just want to make a plea that all regulation is not bad, all planning is not bad. You can provide certainty to businesses, preserve the character of the community at the same time, addressing uh, you know, your economic needs and providing for the tax base. Thank you. And I have a quick question just to, uh, hey, for clarification, hey, because I, yeah. Before you say anything, I'm sorry. Um, I didn't catch the name of David. Oh, I'm sorry, David Lawless, 11 Sugarloaf Street, South Deerfield. Thank you. Go ahead, Nate. My question is, um, so we know about the definitions of what businesses need to follow these, um, follow these bylaws. What are the, you know, I haven't seen um, what are the aesthetic requirements? What are, has that been spelled out somewhere? No. Thank you. Uh, I don't know, to answer, I mean, that's where they would be coming to the, the planning board and we would be working with them on a, on a case by case basis that actually is seen as working with the developer. And can I speak, this is okay. Trevor? I just, I just want to say, and therein lies the issue that I have. I don't have a problem with planning. I think it's very important to do all of that. The, um, the vagueness, well, just the, as, as Julie said, the, the clarity of prohibited, right? If you have any of these things prohibited. And then it doesn't say, um, these are the examples. These are the five things that facades that we will accept. These are the colors that we, I mean, are we okay with the look of Atlantic furniture building that's very modern and, and you know, not really a characteristic of old Deerfield. Um, I just really, I feel like this needs to be flushed out a little bit more. I don't think it's wholly bad. I don't think it's wholly good. I think it needs more definition as far as the look that we're looking for. What is that definition? It's not just up to the, you know, seven people that sit there at the time and they kind of go, well, I don't, I guess this looks nice. You know, it really is not about that. It's, it's setting clear examples of 
What is the facade that we want to have? What is the plan that we're looking for? I mean, we have all different kinds of looking buildings up five and 10. I mean, they, they go from really in bad shape to really beautiful buildings. So there's all kinds of, I, I don't know what that character is. I mean, I have a vision in my mind that I think of Deerfield, but, but it's a mix between old Deerfield and, you know, I don't know, something else, you know, I, uh, more colonial. I just don't know what that definition is. And I don't think it's spelled out here. I just feel like this is very restrictive and doesn't leave any examples of where we are going. And what is that look? What is the, um, what is the look? And it, and, and it can't change depending on the election every year, because everybody's going to, those seats change all the time. And, and so we just need to kind of set some consistency on what we are looking for. That's all. Thank you, Trevor. Thank Greg, you. would you like to go yes. next? Yes. Hi, everyone. Okay. Um, sorry, I don't have any video. You can see my messy room. Anyway, um, I would like to respond to a couple of things that were said and to what Trevor just said. Um, on a couple of occasions, um, Trevor has mentioned the need for the town to have a master plan. And mm -hmm. um, I think that what that means to to different people is you know it's a vast range of master plans out there happened. that we can choose from. So um, every, almost everything that has been said, in particular, something that Tali said about um, the um, where did I have it written down here. There not being a cost to businesses. I don't agree with that, but I agree with everything else you said. I think there is a cost. The cost is that they do have to, they can't have their cookie cutter store in our town. But I think that's a reasonable cost to put onto a large corporation that can afford to, you know, modify some building that's already on the strip that's not been used for five years and put a beautiful facade that looks nice and goes with the character of the town. And, you know, to some extent with old Deerfield since we're kind of trying to brand South Deerfield in some way and the strip as part of old Deerfield, it seems like to me. I mean, I don't know that that's the case. That's where I, th I think having a master plan that takes all these things into consideration at all at one time, where we look at economic development in a really you know serious way and we honor the businesses that are in the center of South Deerfield and we, we steer the traffic away from South Deerfield if it's just cut through traffic. We don't need a thousand cars a minute going through South Deerfield to have no business. We need a handful of people that are coming to South Deerfield because they know that the businesses in South Deerfield are great businesses and because they wanna come here. And it's a beautiful town with nice sidewalks where handicapped people can get to and from safely and people can ride their bikes without having to worry about getting run over. And you know, we need a beautiful town center and we need a plan to get everybody on the same page. The other comment I wanted to make was in response to something that Kip Camosa said. I, um, I agree with a lot of the things that, that he said, but one thing that he said was the planning board was influenced by the group of people who came to their meeting. And I don't understand how that could possibly be thought of as a problem. People come to the meeting because they are thoughtful and caring people who wanna have some input into the process. Why shouldn't the planning board listen to the people who care enough to come to their meeting and share their ideas? I mean, everybody has ideas. Most people aren't expressing them, I think, but you know, obviously we all have um, our ideas and we all wanna be heard. The whole thing of a master plan that is upsetting me more than anything else is that you know, I've been on three different committees for several years. I'm on the town common committee, we have a plan. I'm on the building advisory committee and you know we've done our assessments and made recommendations. And the gist of what I think a lot of people feel is that they're putting in time, they're volunteering, they're learning and they're trying to help, but they're not being listened to ultimately that they're not being listened to. The, the whoever pushes hardest is gonna win or whoever has the longest history in town is gonna win. And, you know, we're basically breaking down to camps of, you know, I win, you lose, or you, you know, win, I lose. And that's not what any of us wants, but that's sort of what we have. 
And I think there's a history behind that and a, it's a problem. We need to slow it down a little bit. This is a good bylaw, I think, basically, except for what um, Julie pointed out. What Julie pointed out is that it creates the appearance through the language that it uses that we're not interested in having these big businesses come to town, which we may or may not be. But if we say that, it's gonna make a lot of people look at the bylaw and say, oh, well, this is an obstacle to business. When in reality, it's, it's, an, it's a homage to business. It's a different kind of a business. It's a business that is in a place that's really special that we are creating. It's not, it's not you know, the Hadley strip. I did a, a video years ago with some people in North Hadley, some old farmers mainly, and people who were really upset by the development that was happening in town. And I thought that when I saw what was happening, this is when they built the second mall, that, oh, they're ruining Hadley, what a tragedy. Because I came from suburbia in Natick, where they already had destroyed everything. And there isn't an inch of green space in sight. So when I saw how beautiful Hadley was in the 1980s, mid 80s, I was all against the development. But then I met some people who grew up in Hadley who were so glad when the first McDonald's came to town because there was some place to go. There was something to do in Hadley, finally, you know, and then they went way off in that direction. They have a good tax base, but they have a wretched, you know, corridor of, you know, whatever you want to call that. But we, we don't want that either. I mean, we could have that, obviously. There's a lot of traffic going between, you know, Greenfield and everywhere else and Amherst and whatnot. Thank you, Greg. I, um, we, I'll we stop. Stick with the um, information session. I'm sorry to interrupt you. So the master plan, we need a master plan. That's what I vote for. And we need <laughs> to, to slow Thank it down. You, I really you, appreciate it, Greg. Thank you. Um, Thank you for shutting me up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just trying to move it along. 717 here. Okay. I think that's very Anna, reasonable. What do you think? More comments or? Well, I, I definitely appreciate hearing all of this. Um, and I know that other, uh, you know, when it, when does it come debate and when is it educational? I think from an educational standpoint, it's been very helpful. And, and we do certainly have a lot more to address. In yes, this, this seven I know. <laughs> Thank you. We probably should move on. Yeah, we'll move along. Yeah. Uh, can I speak? I, I don't know how to. My, oh, hi, Rainy. Nancy, or Hi, Rainy. Is it my turn or? Sure. No, if I'm that's sorry. What the board says. <laughs> and, and then I, 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 yeah, I we'll move on after Jennifer is saying I'd like to speak, and I, I don't know if you're going to close this portion. No, I, go ahead, Brittany. Okay, thank you. Again, I'm like Greg. I don't want you to see me. Um, <laughs> I really would like to clarify the dollar general issue. Our town is being branded as snobs. We don't want a dollar general in town. The opponents were not against a Dollar General, they were against a Dollar General at that location. For safety, traffic reasons, for ambience, for fitting in with the other existing things. So please don't confuse, we don't want certain things in our town. That's not the issue. So you definitely need some kind of planning of what you're gonna put and where you're gonna put it. Thank you. Thank you, Rini. Okay. I I, I believe the next yes. piece is um, the solar bylaws. Yes. <laughs> Potentially <laughs> will be less. <laughs> um, uh, Jen, if you could, if I could, I don't know if I can still share my screen. <clears throat> Maybe I can. Yeah, you can. Go ahead. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> um, so here we are. <clears throat> the um, Proposed solar bylaws, um, the objectives of these bylaws are to actually promote solar energy in Deerfield, as mentions here, <clears throat> by making it easier for solar projects. Um, one of the things that we've learned through the past several years, especially with some of the solar installations that we've had in town, is that <clears throat> solar, especially for medium and large scale installations, um, it's a pretty rapidly changing field. And so we have found that we need to clarify and streamline some of our procedures and also set much uh, more clear standards for the medium and large solar arrays, not individual resident solar arrays. <clears throat> uh, 
solar arrays. Um, so again, to emphasize um, to a huge extent, other than some clarification, um, these bylaws are addressing <clears throat> inconsistencies and updates that are needed in medium and large scale projects. In terms of how the solar bylaw works, um, we begin by, uh, by mentioning where solar projects are allowed by right. Um, and and um, this has to do with municipal projects, um, which uh, solar canopies, passer, so, passive solar systems. Um, we, we, um, we do allow certainly, the, as I mentioned, the small scale and the roof mounted solar ener energy systems <clears throat> by right, um, as well as um, these forms of, of, of solar. Here's a nice example of a solar canopy to use the vernacular of the solar world. And, and here is <clears throat> passive solar building design that I think probably some of our middle schoolers could explain better than I could. <clears throat> For our medium and large scale solar energy systems, um, part of what this bylaw does, it ups, updates definitions clearly. Um, <clears throat> certainly um, it does set standards uh, in, including setback requirements and screening requirements and um, requires that um, there is minimum impact on our farms, on our forest land, on our habitat, be it the natural habitat or uh, little critters there wandering around. Um, if you have seen the uh, town meeting uh, booklet that was posted earlier today, um, you'll see the solar bylaw is actually quite comprehensive and this is just a, a a brief over overview, but um, these are some of the um, some of the pieces that are included in our new um, solar energy system bylaws. So, if people have any <clears throat> other questions or thoughts, this was quite abbreviated in relation to the the bylaws, but hopefully. Um, <clears throat> gives you a good example. And, and we have actually talked with the energy committee in town. Um, we've tried to, uh, we tried to do our homework and cover our bases. And um, actually the bylaw was written with consultation and looking at numerous other solar, solar bylaws in other towns. So we feel that this will be a welcome addition for medium and large scale solar systems. Yep. Are you, you going to drive small scale solar systems? Pardon me? Annalie, are you going to address small scale solar systems? Uh, the, the small scale solar systems to a large extent, there's just um, clarification of some of the requirements, definitions. We really did not do uh, much in this bylaw at all to, to uh, change those. So if people have solar mounting in, you know, want to have solar mounting on their rooftops in their yards, um, this bylaw does not address that. Okay, well, in, in the bylaw here, if you don't mind me speaking, in the bylaw here, uh, and that's in the bold, so I'm assuming this is a change. It reference not only the roof mounted but the ground mounted and if you bear with me for a moment here small scale ground mounted solar energy system single residential or small business scale solar energy conversion systems consisted of ground mounted solar arrays or other solar energy fixtures and associated control or conversion electronics or energy storage component occupying no more than 10,000 square feet of surface area. And that is by right. So when I read that, that leads me to believe that an individual residential in a residential neighborhood could put on their property 10,000 or up to 10,000 square feet of solar panels in that is by right and also uh, with 
falling within the building code, those panels could be within 10 feet of the property line, the neighbors. Now, 10,000 square feet, if you think about it, most, most houses may be 15 to 2,000 square feet, 1,500 to 2,000 square feet, 10,000 square feet, uh, up to 10,000 square feet of ground solar panels. I, am I reading that correctly? I just want to make sure. Because if somebody puts 10,000 or up to 10,000 square feet of solar panels on their home property next to your house, is that not going to affect the quality of life and also your property value, if I'm reading that correctly, because that's what it says in the bylaw. If somebody wants to provide some clarification for me, I would appreciate that. And okay. I hate to sound negative, and I don't want to sound negative because I've been an advocate for the last eight, nine years to do a master plan as far as all this stuff. Long-term planning, I support 100%. And if we did that, we wouldn't be here today. So oh, clarification, well, please. Excellent for the, um, the master plan. I will say that um, as you've seen, and rightly so, uh, Jeff, that the uh, solar life laws are quite complicated. Um, I think if I could defer and state that when we- um, Chris Curtis have, is on and has his hand raised. Okay, um, Chris, if you'd like to address. Hi, everybody. Um, so I, actually, I just want to say, um, respond to one comment that was made on the previous bylaw regarding formula based businesses. Uh, first of all, uh, the comment was made that I was behind that bylaw. And uh, that's not true. I uh, just want to clarify that I'm the planning board's consultant. And I've been working with them on the solar bylaw um, and helping them draft these provisions, um, but I did not have any involvement with the formula based bylaw. Anyway, um, the, the bylaw does um, make an effort to um, clarify that certain solar um, uses, small scale solar uses are allowed by right. Um, so small scale um, ground mounted uses are allowed by right. Um, roof mounted um, solar energy systems of any size are allowed by right. Passive solar energy systems are allowed by right. Solar canopies and municipal solar energy systems are, are all allowed by, um, by right. Um, there are provisions that provide protection from, uh, for neighborhoods um, and, and homes um, and their setback requirements um, in the bylaw, for example, that um, provide a setback of 50 feet minimum for the medium uh, scale uses. So I uh, just wanted to clarify a couple of those things. Chris, how about small scale though? That's the medium, but how about small scale for residential? The, small, the setback. The small scale is allowed by right. The setback um, requirement for small scale um, would be the same as, as the building um, provisions for, for any other structure. So it'd be 10 feet, correct? It'd be for 10 small, feet. Yeah, for that's small what scale. the building, right. That's what the building code uh, or our building bylaws. So as, as my point was, somebody could put up to 10,000 square feet next door to your property within 10 feet of your property line. 10,000 square feet, up to 10,000 square feet. That's a sol lot of solar panels. And don't get me wrong, there's, I'm not against solar, but there's some nice solar arrays and there's some pretty poor design solar arrays too. And I would not want in, in my neighborhood, I would not want 10,000 up to 10,000 square feet next door to me. It would have a major impact on my property value. And as far as visual, visual, it would be an eyesore. You, I think most people would agree with that. Thank you. Uh, Jen, do you see any other hands up? Sure. Uh, I don't see anybody else's hands up. Okay. I just scanned because some people use their physical. Well, I, 
could I just ask on that uh, that one topic real quickly? Do, is there an existing uh, solar bylaw for small, you know, residential areas? Or, you know, this ten thousand square foot, you know, concern is that already of available for residents? Have we not addressed it, or is it just? Are there other, you know, is this changing it, or is it already available for people? I just didn't know. There is no bylaws right now. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. <clears throat> Okay, um, moving along here, um, our next area of bylaw <clears throat> uh, suggestions are our proposed site plan review. Um, <clears throat> our site plan review bylaws, the objectives that we had for them is, is really twofold. The initial, actually the initial push for the site plan review revisions um, was in fact to include green development standards. Um, but then as we continued and, and actually as some planning board uh, personnel changed, we realized that there were also some needed areas for clarification. So this new site plan review bylaw does clarify a number of procedures for um, applicants for site plan review, but then also it does um, establish these green development standards um, to, as we've been speaking much of tonight, uh, preserve and enhance our, our the, the look of Deerfield and also be consistent with policies that we have adopted in town. Um, as has been referenced tonight, our, our master plan from in truth, 21 years ago, um, but more recently, the complete streets, the, the infrastructure and resilient policy, and, and even the work that's being done on the town common. Um, many of these are policies and some of it is informal. And as we were referring previously with the formula-based business, um, often it, it does feel important to have some specifics or have better specifics for what we're now wanting to implement for these, um, these green development standards in particular. Um, and, and speaking specifically, such as with the green infrastructure and climate resiliency policy, we can have policies, which can be nice words on pieces of paper, but unless we have regulations and, and guidelines to back up those policies, then um, the, the work that has gone into all of uh, the, the planning and the policy making really is, is, is for naught. Um, in terms of, I mentioned that we, we will be, we are proposing some clarifications to some of the site plan review procedures. Um, in particular, one of the things that, that we are adding is that there would be a pre-submittal meeting um, with the building commissioner and uh, primarily Jen, but members of the town administration. And this is especially um, to make sure that by the time an application is deemed complete and comes to the planning board, which is when the clock starts ticking, by the way, and I'll speak to that in a moment, um, that, that uh, there's a good working meeting. And so that people who are really on the ground with the professional knowledge of uh, frontage and site plans and you know, uh, blueprints and whatnot, that we have a complete application. So um, this feels like a really, really good, uh, procedure to put in place now. We also have clarified deadlines. And again, these deadlines, as you see here, co um, come after the receipt of a completed application. So um, we would have public hearings 35 days after and then a decision um, 90 days after submittal of the complete application. And I certainly, I'll, I'll make a sideline appeal here to people to please, um, you know, go on the website. You can uh, sign up to have notifications when um, different committees and boards that you're interested in um, are having their meetings. And at that point, then you would just have an automatic shoot into your email that, oh, there's going to be a public hearing on, on site plan review or, formula-based business or whatnot, and, and please come because um, we, we need, we, we are working, the planning board is working on behalf of the residents of Deerfield and we want to have your involvement. 
fees are clarified um, and also uh, the voting procedure for, for approving a site plan is clarified. Green development standards are um, uh, actually applicable to all uh, uh, site plan review applicants. And it re they require, but may I strongly state in most of these areas, it states to the extent feasible. Um, the, the green development standards um, do ask that the applicant try to preserve trees, uh, preserve the farmland, the habitat, um, be careful with light pollution, uh, be careful with the waste management while construction is going on. Um, these are very commonly um, accepted sort of uh, standards of practice, um, but that we haven't had that in our town. And again, in a way that can help uh, put some teeth into the policies and the directions that we've heard from our residents that, that um, are, are wanted. Um, one of the sort of fun, I think, and, and interesting pieces of our, um, these green development standards is that in fact, there is um, an optional, there are optional incentives. And again, I think um, in a way of working with businesses um, that uh, if they want to have some concessions in some areas, then maybe they can give us a little bit more in the green development area. So um, in fact, if they would decide to put in some permeable pavement, then they may choose to have a reduction and we've got, these are all defined in our standards, um, a reduction in the frontage requirements or um, a partial waiver on their parking spaces or on their height requirements. Um, so th this, this uh, incentivized optional green development um, piece is in fact optional and it's somewhat limited but it's a start and also certainly an invitation to developers uh, to work with the planning board in a way that works well for the look and feel of our town and our farmlands and our, uh, and our green space, as well as um, development of um, good viable businesses. I don't know if we have any questions. Yes, I do. Jeff Upton again. I'm Jeff Upton. And, and once again, I, I just. Okay. Jeff Upton and then Bruce after. Okay. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I just, in my past life, I've read contract language and I have a tendency to pick things up because I know, I know there's intent in language. But at the same time, uh, there's definitely a true definition of language. And right in the 5420 section, where you introduce green development performance standards, you just use the word in Annalee, and I'm not picking on anybody, but you use the word optional. The only trouble with that is that in, in the language, all uses requiring a site plan review in section 5410 shall also demonstrate compliance to the planning board with the green development performance standards herein before a building uh, permit may be issued. Applicants shall, to the maximum of practical, meet the standards for, and then you do a list. That's not optional. That's, that's a requirement. And, uh, then you do a long list of, of those options. And once again, there's a, there's a few that, uh, you know, low density impact development. The question is, can somebody explain that? What, what are you really talking about there? You know, LID utilizes small, uh, small scale practices that infiltrate and so on and so forth with water. Smaller lots, reconfiguration of lots, green street, parking designs, 
alternative destruction storm with uh, structural stormwater treatment methods. What are those methods? And then parties in interest. And I know you define parties of interest, but that was a pretty long list. Uh, and then we go continue this with, with some of that. And I guess I'm a little confused because there's, there's some contradictory language and uh, with, with some of this, and we get to, I had a question mark where I needed an explanation of uh, fees. An applicant for site plan approval shall be accompanied by a fee as set forth in the planning board's rules and regulations. Have those rules and regulations been established? And if not, when will they be? And then, uh, There's a description about parking here and walkways and driveways, and it goes down through and it's a requirement for the applicant to provide detailed information. There's a requirement for the applicant uh, to provide a uh, tree inventory. If you're talking about uh, uh, you know, a, a multifamily house, two family or whatever, is the homeowner going to actually be able to afford to hire a professional arborist to do a complete tree inventory if it's half an acre or five acres or 10 acres? Uh, you know, I, I just don't know. And then, and then you have something to do with, if I can find it here, about the parking and it goes further i'm sorry but there's just so many questions on this well if i parking thing was the the and this is where i'm i'm confused really confused because in this green bylaw with the, with the parking, you want the planning board shall review and evaluate whether the site development plan meets the following standards to reduce parking and personal vehicle trips and to support walking, cycling, and use of alternative transportation. So then you go through about the parking. Now in this green bylaw, you're trying to get people to reduce the parking in the traffic flow. And the same planning board just recently tabled and will be working on another bylaw for accessory dwellings. And the accessory dwellings are going to allow more vehicles and more traffic. So in one bylaw, you're going to allow additional yeah. vehicles and Let's additional traffic without site plans and that. And now in this bylaw, you want it to be reduced with a site plan by the whoever's developing. Uh, I, that's contradictory. So there's, there's, except to me, that bylaw is not being presented. So that's not contradictory. Thank you, Rachel. Let's keep on to the point of exactly what we're talking about so we can get through this. It's already 743. And I do think it's interesting. That's what we're talking about. As, as we've um, talked at other times, the, tension between trying to work with people with some subjectivity while still having concrete guidelines. I will say that these bylaws, all of these bylaws have been reviewed by council. I think, you know, some of your questions, Jeff, in terms of, and, and as uh, Julie was saying earlier with um, prohibited, um, that we can review that with council again, but, um, they have been very closely vetted by council and, and, but this information session when people are coming forward um, is, is important. And, and I do believe that certainly council has stated that our areas where it says to the extent feasible, um, which obviously there is some subjectivity with that, but that, that means it's not a, re it, you know, that it's a requirement, it's a, a statement that we want to work with the applicant. Are there other, Jen, are there other? Um... Yes, so yes. we had um, 
Bruce had his hand up and then Kip and Julie. Yeah. So Bruce, go ahead. Okay, am I on? Bruce, you're go. Okay, can you hear, hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Oh, okay. Um, a couple things, um, well, some of the comments Jeff had made, but I'd like to go back, back to 5413 where you have scratched out work incidental to agricultural uh, activity. I personally believe that's in direct contradiction to your right to farm bar law and possibly also some of the mass general law. That needs to be checked on a little bit. Uh, it definitely will. And a good example would be um, when the river washed out all the farmland out there, you tell me that all these farmers had to come and get a site plan review before they could restore all their farmland. I don't think that that's a, a, a applicable um, uh, item to be re removed. Uh, 5420, uh, 5415. Um, all through your whole solar thing, you uh, put uh, solar energy system, I think, you can delete electric but yet you left the electric in there and both in two, two uh, there, there's this large uh, solar electric. I'm sorry, you're cutting, it. you're cutting out, so it's very hard to follow your train of thought. Well, you're cutting out as well. So <laughs> I don't know what's, what's uh, where the problem is. I said it in 5415, are uh, you using the words scale ground mounted solar electric and medium scale ground mounted solar electric in these uh, solar uh, bylaw that you're presenting you've changed all that to uh, solar energy, rather than uh, and deleted all the reference to electric. So I don't know whether you, that's something you want to consider. For consistency, thank you. Uh, pardon? Thank you. For consistency, I understand what you're saying. Okay. Chris, did you have a comment? And in 54. Sorry. Hello? I was just oh, wondering if Chris heard comment to you, your question. Well, maybe see what Bruce has to say and then we can. Okay. And I guess in 54.20, to follow up on what Jeff said, I guess I have a problem with, and I know there's a couple other places, to the maximum extent practicable. Now, who determines that and what is a dollar threshold that becomes a uh, maximum extent practicable? I think that's very subjective and I don't think seven people on a board should uh, have the right to uh, determine that for 3,800 other people. And so I'm a little concerned about that because there again, these, I sat on a bylaw committee for a couple of years and because of this reason, the bylaws are terrible that we didn't even look at zoning. Uh, because that's a whole different, that's the planning board's thing, but the general bylaws are just as bad. And that's part of the problem is there's so little uh, clarity to, to too much of this and it becomes very subjective. And, and, and there again, going back to the last one where you talked about character, well, you know, we'll go right back, and I hate to bring Dollar General in, but that character we brought up with that time and time again. Uh, nobody complained about the junkyard down there that's called the state yard. Nobody complained about the uh, propane tanks down there. Those definitely fit in with the character of the neighborhood. Nobody complained about uh, they, where they clear cut all the land uh, and put all the tin metal buildings down there. Yes, the front building is very attractive, but the whole rest of it is a bunch of... Uh, 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 you, bare metal Bruce. buildings. I'm sorry to uh, interrupt you, but you have a bunch. You have a fiberglass dinosaur out there. Bruce? Uh, you know, so who defines character? So, Bruce. So, Bruce, thank you, thank you for your comment. We need to move yes. along. We have four or five other hands. Unless Trevor, you want to, Carolyn, want to proceed differently. We have a lot left on the presentation. Hello. Oh. I, I think we just need we need to move on with some more comments if related to the bylaw, yeah. not uh, opinions. Um, please. Yeah. Okay. No. Thank you for your time. That that was it. Thank you, Bruce. So okay. Have yep. Kip. No. Continue. Continue. Thank you, Kip. 
Hello? Yep, go ahead. Great. Folks can hear me? What's that? Can folks hear I me? I can hear you. Yes, Kip, go ahead. Oops, you muted. Hold on. You muted yourself. Hold on. Okay, now go ahead. Okay. Um, I know some of my comments might seem a little negative, but I'm really trying to help and make this uh, a whole better process. And I'd like to start real quick by saying, I, I could be wrong, but I think I have the only off the grid home in the town and I'm very conscientious and aware of anything green. Um, but I, I, if I read some of these proposals, I don't think folks really understand the financial impact to anybody. Um, I'll give you a, a great example. Um, we are a stretch energy code town. Um, and you know, they, it sounds good, but it doesn't do anything for anybody. And I'll tell you why, because it, being a stretch energy code town, you have to apply for a building permit. And before you get the building permit, you have to hire a HERS rater. You pay the man $1,500. He gives you one piece of paper that tells you your house fails. This whole stretch energy code has nothing to do with making your home more energy efficient. If the code said you needed better windows, better doors, better insulation, it'd be great, but it doesn't. All it does is create one piece of paper. At the end of the construction, you get this engineer comes back and he does a blower door test. If your house doesn't meet his specifications, they take and say, okay, we're gonna add in the square footage from your basement to make it work. That's what you get for your $1,500. Could, could you um, address the solar or the site plan review bylaws here? The site plan review bylaws, are, are a lot of them are the same thing. There's something that talks about the orientation of buildings for solar. Is there anybody out there that can tell me what the proper orientation is? Well, that would be up to the building commissioner. He can't tell me. I've, I spent four years building this house. And what I learned after talking with a lot of experts, my house generates over 6,000 watts of electricity an hour until four o'clock in the afternoon when it drops down to 400 watts. So even though the sun is up in the sky, we, I don't get the benefit of that sun. Now, this whole solar thing is great, but the earth moves and the sun moves, your home doesn't. And so, you know, it, you have, there's trade-offs, what you do. So my, my problem with this bylaw is, so the orientation of the building is subjective because if you get three solar experts, you're gonna get three separate answers, you know? And the same thing with tree preservation. I want to pres preserve trees too. But if there's some large trees that are right in the way, you know, why does somebody have to ask the planning board to remove them or even go through any of this? You know, and, and when it gets down to the residential area, the cost of doing all of this, you know, I watched the Treehouse Brewery, and this is important. 48 minutes, they were in front of your board and received approval. It cost them nearly $30,000 to make that presentation. And they were given waivers for signs and for tree inventory and something else. And what I'm getting at is that you, the more of these bylaws that keep coming up, it just keeps adding more and more and more money. You know, 20 years ago, can I, can I, I make would- make a comment to what you said, Kip, about the- oh, sure. um, energy you know uh, standards in the town yep. i have to say that um that i know because i work for a building department for many years that the hers rating is quite important because it gives you the rating of the glass of the windows the rating of your insulation your roof um it it, it takes into play a lot of things that make your house energy efficient and it is important for a stretch code community. And those are the things that the building commissioner, building inspector are looking for when they receive that HERS rating. Um, it just well, makes it so that we're, we're, we're building houses that are to a certain standard in Deerfield, which is important. What, what you're saying is not true. It, 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 what it is. Listen, let, let me explain. Excuse me, excuse me. We have, we're talking about, this is the information night. Can we please keep uh, talking well, about the amendments and not personal opinions, please? Sure, sorry okay. about that. 
Okay. Another no, it, uh, just anyway. general, we need to move along. It's that, already eight o'clock and we haven't even gotten to the budget yet. Julie? Right. But there's, if, if this is supposed to be an information hearing, what, what's the town meeting going to be like? It's going to take a whole week. The, you know, there's more. You talk about this blue roof design and you want it to hold water. Does anybody have, have you uh, consulted with an engineer of the weight of this roof? and how feasible it would actually be to build one, you know, and it, it, these things just keep going on and on and on and on. And you, you could have a conversation about every single line on every single article, uh, 54, 30, every, even the definitions. I mean, you know, it's, there's a lot there, a real lot. Thank you, Kip. Yeah. Julie? Okay. Thank you. Julie, would you like to go ahead? Sure, I have two very quick comments, both of which Bruce already hit. One is questioning the work incidental to agricultural activity in item 5413 um, and the correlation of that with the um, town status as a right to farm community. Um, just to throw out there about trees, I, I have 100 acres, we have a lot of trees. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other question I have is the um, in 5420, where it says to the maximum extent practicable, did council comment on that? It, it that seems like a statement made for argument. Um, well, my understanding is that it's a fairly um, fairly common term. But um, thank you. 54 has his hand waving like he knows what he needs to say about this. Um. Thanks. I'd like to actually respond to a few of the comments, if it's okay, just because this is an informational meeting and I want to try to get information out. Um, the comment on the maximum extent practicable, practicable is language that town council actually provided to the planning board and suggested was, was appropriate for that particular case. Um, the, the issue of work incidental to agricultural activity, which is a deletion uh, that also came from town council and the reason she wanted to delete that is that agriculture is exempt um, from site plan review so it's not appropriate to to list it in the bylaw at all so it is consistent with right to farming um, we're just trying to be consistent with the zoning act uh, the, the comment about parties of interest um, there's a specific set of language that um, asks for notification of parties of interest that comes from the state zoning act so that's prescribed by the state zoning act um, and isn't really an optional um, thing for the town to decide about um, a really important point is that this bylaw does not apply to single family or two family residences so there were a lot of comments that expressed concern about what, what would homeowners have to do about this particular issue, homeowners for single family and two family residences are not impacted in any way by, by these provisions. Um, those are the ones that I, I can quickly respond to, I guess, um, out of the comments. Do we have any new hands, um, Jen? And maybe then uh, the next the next bylaw is relatively short and the- Jeff Upton. I think- Again, in, in terms of new ha new comments. Oh, new ones? I don't know about new, but his hands up so I can um, yeah, see it here. It oh. might have been left up. Okay. Left up. Okay, I'm going to lower it. Thank I you. will move on then to our last one, which is uh, municipal facilities use and dimensional require requirements that are proposed and um, in particular brought forward by the select board to the planning board. Um, the proposed changes are to reduce front, well, pertain as it mentions to municipal facilities and um, that we're looking at the frontage requirements that it would change from 100 feet uh, 250 feet in the center village district. Um, and it would also, these, these, um, this proposed bylaw would <clears throat> allow the, the planning board to waive or reduce setback requirements if it is in the public interest to do so. Um, there's a question as to, you know, why would we, 
why do we need this? Um, I'll say as an aside, I've been working with Lily Dwight and Carolyn and a number of other people on um, identifying town owned properties and unknown properties in town. And it is just astounding how many parcels of land, small and large, um, are either owned by the town, we didn't even know about it, or I mean, we've known, but it's not, now it's in a list. Um, and so we want to be able to, you know, we, the, the town wants to have the flexibility to be able to address some of these issues for um, getting, properties on the tax rolls, um, selling them for tax credits otherwise, um, and, and actually have them, have it come to town gain. Um, if you're wondering sort of what we're talking about with the frontage requirements, here's a, um, this is an older uh, site plan for the, uh, the, the town park, but as you can see, here is a, um, the, the frontage and then here is, is the park. So um, now I'll say, and coming back to um, why, should the, why should municipal properties have a special situation? Well, first of all, certainly um, our municipal properties are um, for the benefit of the town. And, um, and also too, there are a number of layers of oversight when a municipal property um, is developed. The select board uh, addresses the development, the planning board, town meeting ultimately funds the municipal projects. Um, so it really was seen by the select board initially and then the planning board con concurred that um, it really was reasonable for the town to have more flexibility in utilizing these projects. Um, I'm not sure if anyone on the select board would, um, would like to elaborate since they well, I, I'll just mention that we had um, some plans for the Leary lot and having a 50 foot access is important for that. Um, also, you know, um, we just need flexibility for a lot of the pro, um, potential projects that we have for senior housing, as, as Anna Lee had um, referenced, but also just, you know, we have a senior center that we need to do. Um, we have the library project and, um, you know, that has to find an alternative location. So um, during that renovation and building process. So we, we would hope that this would give people, would give the town flexibility. Do you have any, any um, questions? Yes, I have John, uh, Attorney McLaughlin. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I have uh, some questions. Um, uh, first off, we appreciate this finally went up. We've been asking to see these um, actual language for ages and uh, they've finally gone up and I appreciate that. Um, I do question some of the explanations that are given in the document that supposedly talks about the proposed change when you compare what is said in the explanation to what the proposed change could actually do. I mean, it talks about how this is going to reduce uh, in the central village from 50, from 100 feet to 200 feet. But the picture you just showed is a massive in, uh, quasi industrial use in an industrial zone. And there, if you look at your proposed language, you'd be reducing from 200 feet to 50 feet, um, at least, I'm, I'm asking is is the intent to only have this apply in the central village or would it imply apply to industrial you know you've got like you know massive with hundreds of cars coming in buses coming in it's in an industrial district and you're uh, my reading of it I just got this it looks like you're saying you want to reduce that from 200 feet which is normal for the type of type of use you're talking there down to 50 feet or are you only saying that this applies in the central village in which case we're not even talking about this project um, you, the explanation that comes before the proposed language doesn't comport with the proposed language is what it looks like. It, it's making it look like it's not as bad as it really is. Um, I, I could be wrong. Uh, and um, 
Uh, I don't have a, a zoning map in front of me, but we would include um, from the railroad bridge down through central, cent, um, you know, central village. I don't know if that is included in what you're talking about, but the well, idea is for, for Brayburn. Um, if you're going to do like a housing development, you can put in, um, you only need 50 foot access for a subdivision road. So the idea is to be able to have the 50 foot access. Well, that that's not entirely accurate. I mean, um, for the this, the property where the the quote, quote unquote park property is, that's industrial. And what you're doing is industrial size, hundreds of vehicles, buses, cars, hundreds of people. Um, that requires 200 foot frontage, not 100 like Central Village. And 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 also the the um, the um, the subdivision road would be a feeder subdivision road into industrial. Then you would need eighty foot frontage, not fifty foot frontage. So I'm just trying to find out if people, if your intent is to try to fix the problems with the park lot with this provision. If you are, the explanation that you give before it is inaccurate. Because what you're really trying to do is it, oh, it is C one, C one, and CVRD. So this would not apply to industrial zoned districts. That's not what it. I, I, I'm going to have to look at the map. The map isn't. In, it's intended to do downtown South Deerfield. So are you saying unequivocally that right now that you would not use this zoning change? No, we're not no, saying that. No, no. It, the intent is for the downtown's um, area. So from- So it, it's, excuse me, let, let me just clarify. It is for municipal projects, wherever they are. Oh, that's what I thought. So then your, yes. expla then your explanation above it is any accurate, I, not I accurate didn't at all. The explanation, so I'm not sure what that explanation is, but it doesn't say, you know, our zoning language does not talk about, does not talk about districts. Of course it, it does, of course projects. it does. Of course it does. What you're what you're saying is zoning language doesn't. Well, I don't know what you mean. Your bylaw clearly for anyone to do work on the park property, to get any building permits on the park property, the old Prevere lot, you would need 200 foot frontage. 200 foot. And to put in a subdivision road, you would need 80 feet to do that. And you're now saying we want to bring everything down to 50 feet. The, and that the frontage is not just, um, you know, to stop big capitalists from, you know, ravaging the, the neighborhoods. The frontage is to protect the neighbors. Okay. Um, so, you know what? You are correct. It's, it is it is for municipal projects in all in all the different all facilities. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure what this, this but direction. That, the explanation that references only Central Village yeah. is inaccurate. And when you talk about subdivisions, right. that's, 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 that's correct. That's, that's inaccurate, that's, that's too. That is wrong. That is wrong. And it's so is the other explanation. I mean, all the explanation is inaccurate. What you should really say is that we are trying to put in, an in on the industrial lot, hundreds of cars, hundreds of, you know, not hundreds of buses, but hundreds of cars and buses into an area that would normally require an 80 foot area for a subdivision road and 200 foot for frontage with 50 feet. And I, I submit that um, zoning is to protect the neighbors from the uses that are being undertaken, whether it's being undertaken by the town or, you know, some big corporation doesn't change the effect on the neighborhood. You're trying to put in this massive development with residential houses directly abutting. And that's what you're trying to do. You're saying, well, look, you know, we're the town, so we don't have to obey the laws of the town. Um, that's essentially what you're saying. I understand that's for the voters to decide, you know, Correct. But, right. but the explanation Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The explanation is inaccurate and wrong and untrue. You're right. Yes, you're right Attorney about McLaughlin, that. Sure. You're, you're you're correct that it was not just the CVRD. In fifty foot, saying you all you need McLaughlin. Is, yes, okay, but I'm saying an argument. This I'm not presentation. Saying, uh, while I appreciate your comments, yes, and what I don't appreciate is the argumentative nature of this conversation. Well, I don't agree. We have an entire budget to get through in this session. I there will be time at town meeting to have further discussion. 
So I do appreciate that. And I understand that, changes. but I think, I think it's unfortunate that there's untruths set in the presentation in writing. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree, I'm sir. Not I'm sure sure why there. We can make those changes. So thank you very much. Yes. This is an informational night. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I do believe that the planning board is off the stage. <laughs> well, I've got one other, which okay. is um, number 11, which is the police officer waiver. Um, the purpose uh, is to see if the town will vote to submit a home rule petition to the general court to allow, notwithstanding any general or special law. To the contrary, Gary Sibilia, a, a police officer with the police department of the town of Deerfield to extend the length of service in such position until the date of his retirement or he is relieved of his duties, whichever occurs first, provided, however, that Gary Sibilia is mentally and physically capable of performing the duties of the position, the town may require at its own expense that Gary Sibilia be examined by an impartial physician designated by the town to determine his capacity. So um, this is something we do, um, I wouldn't say every year, but every so often we have uh, officers that serve the town um, with distinction for, for a long time and we'd love to hang them, hang on to them a little longer than, than usually um, they're, they're due to retire, so. Um, Gary's Trevor, Chief Pachurik is here if you'd like him to speak oh, to this. I'd, I'd love to. Yeah, thank you, Chief. John? Again, I think Trevor covered it pretty well. I'll certainly uh, happy to entertain any questions. Okay. That's really all this is. So any other items? I think that's it. Okay. And apparently I can't work a camera. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So... We also have budget items. Give me just a second. Casey, and I will to attempt to share my screen. Okay. 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 So let me make that a little bit smaller. Okay, this is the section that includes the general financial articles. And as we did last year, to try to assist the movement of town meeting, we created what are commonly referred to as consent articles. And the articles include, or they're intended through a single vote to, to, to have town meeting legislatively act on certain types of votes. And in this case, the first consent article is through a single vote to allow reports of officers, handle the elected That's officials pretty. compensation, acknowledge gifts totally. and library interest, mm -hmm. authorize acceptance of grants and contract authority for both the select board and the assessors. And vote the maximum amount to be spent for departmental revolving funds. This, these are general actions that we normally vote at town meet, annual town meeting. So does anybody have any questions about that or why we're doing a consent article? Hearing none, I will move on to the second one. And what I've done just for purposes to try to keep things together, you'll see it when you look at these other the other um, presentation, you'll see that I've separated them through pagination to sort of focus on them. So the second consent article is unanticipated prior fiscal year bills. We received three bills that were related to different projects after the close of the respective fiscal years. And at the request of the finance committee members and the select board members last night, and so to your point, Attorney McLaughlin, we're still processing getting this warrant together. So I appreciate that you're frustrated that we haven't finalized it, but unfortunately, we're still we're still figuring out the nuances. So bear with us. The I was asked to explain these bills a little bit in the content of the articles. And if you recall, Deerfield doesn't normally do a significant explanation in the warrant. But because of COVID, we had to pivot and learn to give more explanation so that when people come to town meeting, 
they have a better understanding of the discussion points. So for this, for these prior fiscal year bills, we have one for $7,920 related to the Mill Village Road Upper Watershed Study. And the bill was for a study of the factors that affect drainage from the contributing watershed along the Mill Village, that feed to the Mill Village Road culvert because we were in process of developing the plan to replace it. And then the second one was $6,200 to fund an unanticipated bill related to the peer review for Dollar General. And unfortunately, we didn't receive that until a couple months ago. And when you have an unpaid bill like this or an unanticipated bill, it has to go to town meeting and it requires a super majority vote. And so the third one is the transfer for the sum of $1,744 to fund an unpaid bill related to the town building assessment survey. And so this bill was for the mailing costs and online survey of residents regarding town building use as the town building advisory committee began the process of evaluating the buildings. And Julie can correct me if I'm wrong. So Julie, feel free. <laughs> no, that's that's it. It. So the reason they're grouped together in this manner is because they're like, like minded or they're, they're like option vote. So the third consent article are special appropriations. These again are articles that are voted normally at annual town meeting and they relate to specific things that have to be voted and are not necessarily voted during the omnibus budget vote, which is a single article. In this case, through a single vote, because all of these transfers are from free cash, we can group them together. And so the first one is the reserve fund, which is a general vote. And the sum of money of $100,000 is not changed. And this, the reserve fund is administered by the finance committee and intended to be used for unanticipated expenses. The second is the OPEB liability trust fund appropriation. And that amount is $41,610. The OPEB liability trust fund was created basically to invest funds over a period of time to meet the cost to provide other post-employment liabilities for staff at a future time when they retire. And people always have questions about that. And it's, it's complicated in how you develop the number, but the town has a percentage that is indicated every year. And I think Brenda's on the meeting. Brenda, I don't remember what the percentage is. It's, so if you're still here, could you tell me? It's 4% of what we pay for uh, each year's retirement, current retirement amount. Okay. Still woefully you, inadequate. Yes. Woefully inadequate as usual, but we'll get there. <laughs> I, I, I don't think it's a question. There's not a question that it's not adequate, but at yep. least it's something. It's something and it's, it's important. It's something. And we and we are and it's important because it does affect the town's bond rating if we don't have a plan in place and we aren't starting to contribute to it. Lily, You're muted, Carolyn. Oh, it's, we've been consistent about it, and that's why it's important. Mm -hmm. Casey? Yep, I see her. Go ahead, oh. Lily. Hi, thanks. I, it, it was really just a question about process, about um, put when these things are put together. If there's a problem with one piece, what happens? How is it managed? So the moderator, and, and understand, Lily, I've been working with the moderator and town council on this for a couple of weeks. But as the budget was, was being finalized, we've made some adjustments. And now I am not a moderator and I don't play one on TV. So let me just put that caveat out there. But there are methods that are available to the moderator to separate something out if town meeting chooses not to take the vote as a single vote. The reason these things are grouped in the manner that they're grouped is because we think that they're regular items and that they're all funded, in this case, for this article, they're all funded from free cash. 
So we had that conversation, the moderator and town council and I about how to frame this. Does that answer your question? Uh, well, sort of. I mean, I understand the logic behind it. It makes a ton of sense. And we usually do whip through these. But I guess my question was, is there a problem with them being grouped together if somebody challenges no. or sees something in one no. part of it? We can There's a method that where okay. you can separate That's, them out. That answers the question. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. But that's why we crafted it this way in case there was a question. <laughs> so out of district placement is another special appropriation. And that's for placement for students who want to attend a vocational or other specialized education um, school outside of our district. For instance, Smith Vocational School is one of them. And it pay this item pays for the tuition and for the transportation and we have we have one student currently attending smith Voke and another possibly attending in the fall so this is budgeted for two students with transportation for those two students this last one is the 350th celebration you, you, appropriation um, and i think excuse me uh, casey i just want to interrupt if the child chooses not or the student does not go to smith folk and we have appropriated the money then the mo money will go back to the general fund under free cash thank you for the clarification carolyn that's true so the last one is the 350th appropriate celebration appropriation and these are funds the town's been setting aside over a period of time to fund the activities to lead us to the 350th. And I think Carolyn can actually explain this much better than me. Um, the idea is that there's seed money. Um, uh, are, we're very fortunate to have a really robust um, fundraising committee and uh, all the other towns that we've um, talked to around us that have had celebrations have had a budget of around 100 to $200,000. And so um, by appropriating $10,000 a year for four years, we have um, the ability to have seed money and then um, help fund the fundraising committee will uh, raise the rest for our celebration. And, to, and, um, and by doing it in four years in a row, we're not um, making it be a one-time big appropriation or breaking it out. More affordable in other words. Yes. Was there any other questions on this consent article or on the previous consent articles? I don't see any hands up. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay. This is another one of our regular articles. It's the classification and compensation plan that gets adopted every year. And in this case, the FY22 compensation classification schedule is a little bit different than past years. The town completed, or is substantially complete, let me rephrase. The town is, has substantially completed a reevaluation of our comp, and, comp plan, classification of our positions and the compensation related thereto. And the plan, that study included a number of things. And so, what I did was tried to outline this somewhat so people could understand it. But essentially, the personnel board and select board agreed that this needed to happen last year. So we actually got a grant to pay for most of it. And the study includes an evaluation of the job descriptions and our organizational structure. It, there's a, con a comparison of town positions and pay rates in the market then this could also provide us the required pay equity, and it does, pay equity evaluations that towns have to complete on an annual basis. It also, what we were trying to find out is what's the long-term sustainability of our current plan. And so we began with the evaluation of the job descriptions and discussion, the study, the study consultant evaluated those, had conversations with most of the employees. There's one department that's still, they're still working and that's in process. Um, subsequent to that, there's a development of revised job descriptions. And 
almost concurrently, the consultant does a comparison of Deerfield's wages to wages in the marketplace. And that marketplace is really somewhere in the neighborhood. And there's one person on this meeting that's going to disagree with me about this, and he can feel free to chime in. But the hiring market is generally within 30 minutes to 45 minutes of where an employer is cited. So the comparison of wages was done between actually Franklin and Hampshire County. There were several towns in both counties that were used and they ranged in size to really get an idea of where Deerfield fits. So there were larger cities, smaller towns and the study itself through averaging and median um, metrics sort of balances that. The results of the study indicated several things. The job descriptions for many of the employees did not change substantially, but the ones that did change showed an increase in responsibility, judgment, complexity. These are all terms that are performance related in each job description and indicate a level of expectation that we can expect as an employer of the employee for the work performed. It also pertained to any statutory requirements or statutory knowledge that needed to be captured and reflected in the job description that relates to what the level of expectation that the town has in certain areas, particularly the town clerk, for instance. There's a lot of statutory requirements. The, we also found that there were several positions that were consistently underpaid. And to some extent, it could have been the hiring process many, many years ago, or the fact that another thing that came out of this was in an indication that the lower end of the pay scale, and I'll scroll back up, the lower end of the pay scale, which is steps one, two, and three, are very low in the market. They're actually measured as below the market on our pay scale. So that actually helped us figure out why we were having trouble hiring people in that, in that area, one to three. It showed as well that the comparison of the higher end steps in the plan, hold on to your stomach, sorry. I think we said step seven to step 10 were actually near or above market. So Deerfield on that end of the scale fits very well within the market. However, we all know we're in tough economic times. So we asked for assistance to plan for this because we knew we needed to make adjust pay equity adjustments for certain positions that showed the need to be increased. But we also needed to make an adjustment that was sustainable for the town and equitable for employees. So what we received and what we've discussed at, a, at several meetings was a change to the, to actually move to a new classification plan in FY23 that drops the first three steps that you would see here. So those go away and the entire plan shifts and has 12 steps. So we start higher on the scale so we can better meet the market need in terms of the starting a position from ground zero with very little experience, maybe not as much knowledge and or, exp, or understanding of municipal government. But we knew that was gonna be expensive when we started looking at the numbers. So what, we, what was suggested by the consultant and discussed by everything was doing this in a two phase approach. And that would be make a change in FY 2022 that recognizes an increase to employees and allows us to get closer to what that transition number would be for FY 2023. Because the change that we would see in a new classification plan would be seven grades as opposed to six and 12 steps. So sorry, I lost, I, I looked at something and got distracted. Give me a second. So the increase that we suggested for FY 2022 across the board for all employees would be 3%. This encompasses the people at step 10 who only get longevity or COLA increases and provides an increase for 
employees that are on the scale. For people that we need to make adjustments because their, their job descriptions have changed substantially or the statutory requirements have increased, people that need a pay equity adjustment. We suggested that there be an adjustment of one step for that pay equity in addition to the 3% increase. And then we would finalize a transition to a new classification plan in 23. And that would mean, again, like I said, seven grades as opposed to six. If you look here, we have six grades. It's way over to the left. Um, we would change that to seven, seven grades. And that encompasses or reflects in understanding of cabinet level positions. And those are positions, like I said, with significant statutory responsibility or those positions with complete, with growth and complexity judgment, supervisory responsibility, all those elements that are performance related. And the increase between the steps, and I think this one, this one is the key factor in creating a new classification plan is the incremental in increase between steps and this is not set in stone, but that suggested percentage is two to 3%. That would allow for more sustainable growth for a period of time over those 12 steps and would give us the ability to affordably add additional COLA adjustments. And those are cost of living adjustments because fundamentally right now, it's very hard for us to fund our plan. Go ahead, Julie. I can wait till you're done. I'm pretty much done. <laughs> okay. Fire away. I have just a couple quick questions slash comments. First off is that I think this is, my me personally, this is not finance committee speaking. I think this is marvelous that we are um, increasing the number of steps and decreasing the range. So the percentage step of each step increase is going to be much smaller than has been in past. Um, and that will be much more sustainable and it'll be much easier to achieve our two and a half percent and stay within prop two and a half. So I think it's marvelous. Um, that's thank said, you for saying that that was the piece <laughs> that I missed. Um, that said, I, I have two comments about the way this is presented. Um, one is that the decision for FY22 is to maintain the current plan structure, add a 3% increase for all employees, but there's no step increase for any employees unless you get an equity adjustment. I don't think it said Correct. that. And then it's suddenly, I'm suddenly wondering as I'm looking at this, whether that need, I don't know what dictates the step increases and whether that is something that needs to be clearly voted on by the town or is that like a policy and you can just change the policy without the town voting or do you see what I'm asking? Well, the town does have to vote it and we also have to have a hearing on it. I've been reviewing the bylaws significantly because Skip always reminds me to look at the bylaws. So we did, this requires a hearing and in anecdotal conversations, there is no performance tie to the steps right now. We don't have a performance management system. And right. so one thing that I heard very clearly from finance was the unsustainability of five, four to five percent steps between each each um, percentage between each step increase. From what I have listened to you all say is that's not affordable under Prop two and a half because the entire right. municipal budget exactly. can only go up by two and a half percent. So we needed to make a change that was sustainable, but also equitable, because when you add on COLA adjustments, then you're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 7%. Yeah. So while I understand that employees may find this difficult, on the other hand, we have to make sound management decisions about how to affordably pay people. And so one of the things that I, I think would be, is very useful is the shift from deleting the lowest paid steps because we do find that they're below the market. So that shift is gonna make it easier for us to employ and retain people because you will have that, still have that incremental increase over those steps. The steps grow by two steps, <clears throat> excuse me. The steps grow by two increments 
longevity is still in place. But fundamentally, one of the consultants recommendations was that we need to make some personnel decisions related to certain elements of, of how we can, how we move forward. And that's, do we put a performance management system in? That was the recommendation that we, that we consider that. Now it's not on the table for FY 2022 because we're not making a substantial change in the plan. The plan structure stays the same. The differences are between the steps and the allocation of 3% to everybody. That would not be the case if we didn't make this change. So anybody at step 10 um, wouldn't receive even a COLA this year. So, and that was the, that was the information that was sent out when we did the budget. So that actually wasn't my question. My question was much more like in the weeds. Um, I assume that, and, and I'm not suggesting that any employee of the town would do this. I'm just hypothetically. If I were an employee of the town and I have a contractually or something, a step increase every year until I reach step 10, to this year I'm step four, next year I'm going to be step four again, even though I get the 3% increase. Is there, is there something, do we need to change something so that the person can't come back, this hypothetical person can't come back and say, my contract says I'm supposed to be a step five next year. I know you said you weren't doing that, but it's not running anywhere. Go ahead. Trevor. So people with collective bargaining agreements, this doesn't apply to them. Right. Collective bargaining agreements have their own and we're still negotiating one. Go ahead, Trevor. So um, that's correct. So none, none of the contracts that are already out um, that wouldn't affect any of that. Um, it, and, and really every year the, the compensation plan gets voted and, and, yes. um, and, and the normal. budget gets voted. So they don't have the ability to come back and ask for anything different. So each year we, we kind of set that number and, and set the budget number. So they aren't required or um, obligated to a step each year or to a COLA. Okay, that was- And that's point. the piece that, so that th is- My other comment is that um, the way it's printed right now, it says recommended by finance committee at the bottom, which implies that finance committee has recommended the whole FY23 thing as well. Correct. And I'm not saying we won't, but we haven't yet. So what- okay. I have that's very good. I'll make yes. that sound, yeah. Is, well, yeah, maybe put the recommended by finance. I see that like in, right in the under the thingy. It and doesn't then say that. Um, one thing that you make a good point is part of the reason that that the explanation flows the way it does is because you've got, two, it's a two-phase thing. So I can correct that and repost this. And I appreciate the comment. I didn't think about it like that. Um, yeah. And I can repost it and change that put the recommendation up like right under the, the chart end of the or table something. right right and then so you thank know, maybe you. put a note or something under it that explains this yeah because that's one thing I didn't I may not have called it out heavily but FY23 is not it has not happened FY23 there's still decisions that need to be made and there's a process that both personnel and the select board uh -huh. and finance committee are going to have to go through and we're hoping to be able to do that much more quickly to give everybody some time to talk about it. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. And so the next article is the omnibus budget. And again, what we tried to do this year, as we did last year, was provide the numbers in the warrant. We didn't used to do that. And the reason is to help people understand that these are the changes they've seen or will see in our requests. And I, th I think it's- Trevor, um, did you want to speak to this or even Julie? Sure. Yes. If well, there's I any just, comments you'd well, like I, to give, I'd appreciate I just, it. I just, I think the easiest thing to say is just that it is a level service budget. It, we're yeah. not, we're, we're just trying to maintain the services for the town. And it, and it is a little, um, it's almost a 4% increase overall, but it's still right. a level service budget. And I, I just wanted to mention this year, I, I just want to thank the Finance Committee, the Capital Planning Committee, um, you know, Select Board all really worked together along with Casey and Brenda and, and all others just kind of 
really worked together this year on the budget and um, it's been a nice process. We kind of did a lot of meetings together. And as you can see, they're, they're you know, they're all, uh, we recommend this, the select, the finance committee recommends it. We've all um, kind of worked very hard together to kind of come up with our capital projects, which you'll see in a little bit and and the budgets to, um, to try and provide the services needed um, in concert with each other, working together. And I think it worked very well this year. I just also just want to, as Trevor said, really want to thank the finance committee and Julie especially for being so accommodating. Um, mm -hmm. We it was been a very difficult year with COVID and um, the budgeting information coming out from the state. It was delayed and we weren't sure of some of our budgets because of it. Um, and uh, the finance committee was very accommodating. So I just want to say thank you. I'm going to throw that in there too. Thank you to everybody. This We, we did have a, a interesting budget process that was a little bit different than I had experienced before. So I really appreciate everybody being willing to do that and all the work the department has, Brenda, everybody has done the most amazing work. So one thing that I did ask Brenda for is this pretty little pie chart because I think pretty little pie charts are fun, but it does it give you a flavor we, of the percentages. And how much we care about education in this town. It's obvious by that chart. And so one thing that I do think is worth mentioning here is COVID had a significant impact on education and municipal services. It had an impact on everybody. But one thing that we really had to do was figure out how to pivot. And meetings like this are an example of that. They are not easy. But this is, this is where we are right now. And, and things are going to change soon. But we wanted to, I want to really acknowledge the fact that this has been a, a, a heavy lift for us. This is something the public sector has been doing for years, remote meetings and stuff. We haven't been doing that. And I also want to acknowledge the hard work because the town administrators have had conversations. We tend to, to talk to the superintendent quite a bit. And the hard work that the school committees really did to try to adjust for extra expenses they didn't they did couldn't really picture what they would look like throughout FY21 and going forward into FY22. There are, there are grant funds that are coming through for towns and schools, but there's still modification that is being worked out in school budgets as we speak. So I really want to put the plug down, put the plug out there for everybody to appreciate what school committees are doing to, to modify the initial budget that we discussed was much higher than what you see here even. So they've done some hard work to adjust funds and really help the towns. Hey, John, can I so talk for one second? On. Sure. So uh, go back up to the pie chart, please. At some point in time, I would like to explore in the future taking town inspection services out of public safety. Uh, building inspector, the... Um, all the commissioners that are over there, their salaries show in the public safety line item of 8%. And that's $170,000 worth of salaries for the building commissioner, board of health inspector, plumbing inspector, electrical inspector, their expenses and the, the public safety percentage truly, um, you know, is probably one or 2% lower than that current 8%. So I, I know it's just a software, item because that's how we track it fiscally but I just I, I always try and be as accurate as possible it may also be something that's required in the UMIS guide we'll have to talk to Brenda John but we can ask that question yeah she's not rolling her eyes at me yet so <laughs> all right the next one and I think Trevor can talk to this one well this, this is the sewer I'll, wastewater enterprise I'll help, I'll help move along the meeting uh, this is really just okay. waste, wastewater treatment and enterprise fund. You know, this is uh, we're starting to work on our sewer projects. And finally, um, just an update to people on on the meeting that um, we've had our first construction meeting uh, on Tuesday and um, rolling forward. Uh, you'll see equipment and trailers and all that stuff starting down on the plant. I can't thank the community enough for finally stepping forward and, and working on our on our wastewater treatment. We have a long road to go, but but we're, we're starting and, and this budget shows that um, we have, you know, revenues and we're using money from our retained earnings and, um, and obviously quite a, quite a bit of an expense um, as we start to, you know, pay for our, our clarifier 
and um, that we already replaced, and then all the other work and the debt service kind of going forward. The, the numbers will will grow over the over the years here, but um, pretty straightforward. Brenda, do you want to add anything? I think Trevor covered it pretty well. Uh, he did mention that we were going to pay off the whole clarifier in this budget. Uh, and then, of course, start working on uh, interest for the phase one upgrades. Yep. Okay, which we will be bonding for soon. Yes. This next item is the South County EMS Enterprise Fund. Again, similarly showing you revenues and expenses, but there's other information in here and the assessment calculations are outlined. The percentage that each town pays is outlined. Is there anything anybody wants to add? Um, the, it's our pretty straightforward. Yes, but I, do, I would like to say that our contribution to this has been pretty flat. Um, mm -hmm. We've been very lucky, even though we've had um, growth of service um, and additional, additional um, trucks on, um, we have our contribution to the um, service has been level, pretty much level. And I'd just like to say how proud I am of, of South County EMS. They're an amazing, amazing um, enterprise. They, they serve our residents very well. So kudos to them. I'll echo that. Not that I would echo it for everybody else. Yes. Right. We, have, we have an amazing group of people that work in this town and, and we try to do our best for the residents. So, okay. Capital projects. So we got a lot of capital projects this year and I, I want to give the, the ADA people out there to the Capital Improvement Planning Committee. They worked really hard, not only on their own to develop priorities and, and Julie made this point last night that the work that capital did to review all the projects that we had and there were a lot of them and then to prioritize what was presented to the select board and the finance committee was amazing. It helped us really dig in and figure out what we could do and what funds we were gonna to use to do that. So what you see here, and it's separated by funding sources. The ongoing elementary school work, which was replacing flooring and restroom renovations will continue. These are updated numbers from and they're, they haven't increased terribly much. I think the re flooring replacement was the only thing that increased from projected numbers. Um, so those two items, and as Julie mentioned earlier, there's activity that's going on, particularly around how to use buildings. And one thing that, that Capital spent a lot of time chewing on was senior needs and feasibility. And I have to say, um, Chief Pachurik was very helpful in, in getting us to a good place on this because we've applied for a grant to help us. But if we do a senior needs assessment to figure out what seniors want to see in the communities, all three communities, because this is a regional service. And then I think if we know what they need to see or what they would like to see in services, we can better, better make decisions about how we utilize space. And that's what the feasibility piece of this is intended to do. So thank you, John, for helping us get here. Um, the other thing that was really important, both to actually all three committees, I think, the Select Board Finance Committee and Capital was starting to deal with some of the infrastructure and that included asphalt sidewalk repairs. We received estimates, we got some help from the DPW superintendent, thanks, Kevin to get some sort of an estimate on what we could, what we were looking at for funds. And then some tough decisions had to be made about how we would fund it. So you see free cash is a funding source uh, for part of this. And then capital stabilization is also a funding source for part of this, because this type of infrastructure is an asset and the town, it behooves the town to take care of that asset so that we can serve the citizens to the best of our ability. Um, one other thing, the roadside mower is a special revenue fund. This is the fifth lease payment and last lease payment for this. And this is a pass through that happens, has happened for the past four years, Brenda. That's correct. Thank you. Go ahead, Trevor. Uh, so I wanted to just kind of jump back to the asphalt sidewalk. So this is a little 
um, confusing. There's a 500, a little over $500,000 request. We, we have, um, after discussions with all three boards, we decided to move forward with about half of that, 250,000 this year, which we would take 100,000 from free cash and 150,000 from our capital stabilization account to start, um, start to address some of this. Uh, there was a question why asphalt? Asphalt is so much more economical. There are areas in town that we will be using cement. Um, and especially when we get downtown, um, you know, we'll have granite curbs, cement, it'll all be ADA compliant and, you know, working with our complete streets program. Um, but there are long stretches of town that, that we can affordably do a whole lot more in asphalt. Um, so, you know, very long stretches we'll probably do in the asphalt. We'll have some separations at crosswalks and at road intersections and certainly our downtown that we'll try to do more cement. It's just, you know, quite a bit more expensive. So we really wanted to start with getting some of this stuff going this year, tackle it again next year, depending on what we have for money and just kind of rolling along until we really address all the needs. There's a lot of needs. It's probably the number one thing that people ask for repairs on in town is, is the sidewalk. So this is our commitment to get started. We'd love to do it all in one year. We just can't. So just want to jump in on that. And when I mentioned the hard work everybody did, this is part of it is really digging in and figuring out what we can afford and what we can't. And so the municipal building fund, we know through the evaluations that the town building advisory committee did that several of the buildings are in need of repair and that we need to start funding for that. So a, a request was put through and you'll see that request was 60,000. What we were able to do, there is a fund that was um, left over from the actual repairs and rehab of this building that the municipal offices is in. And I, and I think it reflects the sale and- It was the leftover sale of that, it the, was the produce sale building the downtown. Town hall. Yep. yep. Yeah. So we those funds had been sitting in a, in a in an account and after some review, Brenda and I talked about it and then we presented the request and, and sort of chewed on it with everyone. And it was decided that we would take the remaining funds in that account, $52,118 and start putting it toward municipal offices, repairs and projects that are outside of regular operations. And as Trevor noted, capital stabilization, we have a request and I have to fix this table to do a portion or to fund a portion of the asphalt sidewalk repairs from that fund. AC? Yes. Hey, um, I just wanna make um, people aware that when we talk about the, the sidewalk repairs, um, that's not gonna be Sugarloaf Street. Um, Sugarloaf right. Street does, does still now right. technically belong to the state. And um, if you really look at this, the footage, you're talking two miles of sidewalk. It's just about a mile each way. Um, yeah. And that's super, super expensive. So the monies that we're looking at are North Main Street, um, South Main Street. We're looking a little bit into Elm Street, but again, that's gonna be part of the- um, um, Larger plan. <laughs> the larger plan, the, hopefully the capital, you know, the, 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 the master plan is what we're looking for. Obviously, Master vision, but, yes. That's you know, and, then, and then there's going to be some in Old Deerfield that have to be uh, addressed also. Yeah. Yep. I just want to make Thank sure you, people Kevin. are aware that I, this I is not that. part of Sugarloaf Street, which I know is one of the major. Yeah, we keep on. We have it now. We're, yep. I, I just want to tell people that we are trying very hard to keep working with the state. The state did put money into the transportation bond bill to do the upgrades and to repair the, the, the sidewalks and infrastructure along Sugarloaf with the idea that the town of Deerfield will be taking that over. But we as a town are not taking that over until it has already been upgraded and, and fixed. So it's coming. Uh, the money has now been allocated. So then you have the engineering and then it goes out to bid and then it gets done. So, you know, I would say two to three more years, just because that's the kind of time frame that the state works with, but it's coming. Go ahead, if I can jump in real quick again on that one. Um, if, if the state is gonna be taking over the sidewalks that base, or if we're gonna be taking over the sidewalks, that basically means the state will be rel relinquishing 
Sugarloaf Street, which has some fairly old infrastructure in there um, and mm -hmm. the drainage that does belong to the state. We have already had two collapses on that road in the past eight years. Um, mm -hmm. So if we're going to be taking that over, we should seriously think about making everything whole and not just the sidewalks. Oh, oh no, no. We I said all the infrastructure, Kevin. That's what the meetings we've been having so far have been, is that the infrastructure needs to be upgraded. Don't worry. So, so the next two items are asphalt rent stabilization. Um, and this are the SCEMS, uh, excuse me, SCEMS rent stabilization. And this is money that right. we, obviously we pay in as, as uh, one member of the, of the towns and the other towns pay in rent for the uh, EMS building. And that money gets set aside. A portion goes for general uh, general maintenance and you know snow plowing and that kind of stuff throughout the year. And then the rest of the money goes in um, to fund larger projects to make sure that we have dedicated funding source. We voted this last couple of town meetings. Um, and so now we're gonna take some money out of that rent stabilization account to do extend the, uh, the driveway a little bit because when the, when the ambulances come in, that we just realized that the that the turnaround radius is just not as big as they need to. So we're going to extend that a little bit, and then we're going to do an exhaust recovery system in there. So when the trucks are backed in and running, they need to run out that their hoses are connected, and that the exhaust gets ex, um, exported out of the building for safety. That, that's actually a, an OSHA requirement now because they yes. are uh, stand they're living there, yep. twenty four seven. Right. Yes. Yeah, I, better that, that Kevin says that. He's the OSHA guy. <laughs> um, Casey, I guess this, this just triggered me. I, I don't remember seeing on the warrant where we transfer the rental money to, um, you know, that we received um, to the that account, that rental account. Brenda, you're up. Yeah. yeah, Carolyn, you voted that at uh, the special town meeting in the fall. So that is permanent. That'll happen forever until you- Oh, okay. Change. So we don't have to have a separate warrant article anymore? No. no. Okay, great. Thank you. I had the same question, Carolyn. I panicked. I know. I just panicked just now. I said, oh my God. I don't yeah, you, watch, you look at this and all of a sudden it sits in your head. What did I forget? So the next article is the Community Preservation Fund and the Community Preservation Committee has its own process where an application is submitted, it's reviewed, they determine whether they want to put this forward for put something forward for funding. And they provide actually Brenda works with them to provide the table that you see here. So there was one application that was approved. And the other piece of this table is really the annual revenue appropriations, which is part of the vote. And do you want to add anything, Brenda? Maybe just to say, I, I don't know if any of the CPC commission is, is, um, is on, but um, they made a point that, um, first of all, there's a minimum requirement into three different reserves each year out of your revenues. That's to community housing, open space, and historical reserve. And they have chosen this year to put 55% into community housing uh, because I believe that that's a project that is high on the priority priority list for the town. Okay, thank you. All right, and then the reserve balances are also identified, which is often a question at town meetings. So what we, what Brenda and I had discussed was trying to, again, give everybody as much information as we can come up with in time to post the warrant. So the next one, is a change of use and confirmation of appropriation for the North Main Street land. And the purpose is to see if the town will vote to change the use and confirm the appropriations for land on North Main Street pursuant, sorry, pursuant to the Commonwealth's request that all appropriations appear in one article. The article does not, does it, it quantifies all those appropriations using the language that we actually had in the previous articles. And it does not change any of the original appropriations from the 2020 town meetings. It does, however, specify a specific reference to the general laws, chapter 45, section three, 
and clarification that the land is limited in use to park and outdoor recreational purposes. So what I did with, what I did was put together a small table that really gives you an idea of what was funded at the different town meetings. We had two, annual town meeting and special town meeting. And then a little bit of background on the, this progression. And John, are you still on? Yes, I'm here. I can't see him. Yeah. Did you want to add anything to this? No, I, I think you covered it in its entirety that you got to kind of specify that we applied for the park grant last summer and we right. did not receive the park grant. However, this late winter, we applied for the Land Water Conservation Fund grant, which is uh, taxation money from the offshore oil industry that cycled through the federal government, through the, the park land to preserve land and water conservation areas. And we've got a preliminary approval that's uh, from the state that's now been sent out to the federal government for final approval for, you see the bottom number on the line down there for the $932,950. And so I'm gonna throw my kudos out here again. Thank you, John, because yeah. uh, he did a lot of hard work pursuing this. And so with the possibility of that award of $932,950, the modification, a decision was made to modify the and confirm these appropriations. I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Confirm the change of use and confirm the appropriations so that it's clear. So we meet the requirements of this grant, the Land and Water Conservation Fund grant program. And here's the text of the article. In this case, I included the text of the article because it identifies the funding sources and the areas where confirmations are, are specified. Jennifer. Hi, I just had a question. Um, just because I can't read the screen, it's very small. Um, is this incorporating the amount that we voted on at the last town meeting appropriating the money? Yes, so what this shows, that. it shows both appropriations. So in annual town meeting, article 13C, we appropriated 1.15 million and that was okay. last June. Mm -hmm. And this, this actually sure. confirms those votes. At special yeah, town meeting in article four, million. we appropriated an additional 1 million for a total of 2.15 million. Okay. So. So that's what's referenced. We have about. to okay. confirm the, the same amounts of money as required by the grant. Does that, does that answer your question or did I just confuse it even more? No, it just, I'm just afraid that, you know, others um, reading this may interpret it as we're asking for another $2 million for this project. Um, but I can see here on the bottom piece that you're saying that um, was previously done. Sorry, thank you for enhancing it. Sorry, you should have weaved at me. <laughs> no worries. My um, head is so close to my laptop that I can. <laughs> so, so it's yeah, just, it's the so confirmation we're confirming the of the appropriation previously approved. Okay. So it's not right. asking for additional money. It's just redoing this for the grant that, um, that John has applied for. Yes. Great. Thank you for uh, letting me ask that because it was just a little confusing. You're welcome, thank you for asking. So that's the sum of the financial articles. Does anybody have any questions? We promised to make town meeting go faster. I don't see hands up. <laughs> we promised to try. That's the whole point of consent articles. That's why we're trying to do this this evening so that we will have less discussion. Yes, at my guess is it will. <laughs> and so the good news is, is there are a lot yeah. of good comments, Attorney McLaughlin, yep. um, comments yep. from John, comments from Carolyn, comments from Trevor, and comments from a bunch of people earlier in the meeting that can help us sort of refine this, this a bit. So we may make some changes to it. Um, the warrant is not complete. It's, there's still some nuances of language, as I told Attorney McLaughlin earlier. There's still some nuances of language that we're working out. Um, 
and the finance committee will be meeting next week to con to make additional votes on the rest of the warrant. They got through a good portion of it. So, but they wanted a little more time and they wanted some information from this meeting so that they could make some decisions later on. So if anybody's interested in watching, you know, participating or watching those meetings, finance committee's meeting on Tuesday at five, I think, Julie, and the select board has a regular meeting Wednesday at six next week and they will be confirming the text of the warrant then. Julie, so are you meeting on Tuesday? We are meeting on Tuesday. She is. Um, Got to get it posted. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, OK. So so okay. that wraps up the presentation tonight. I think we, we still have uh, one item at least because we, we had two other items on our agenda. One was um, to sign the approval and sign the warrant, which we're not ready yet. We don't have to do tonight. So, so we will- uh, Can I just that. verify that Casey does not want us to come in tomorrow to do that? No. Okay. We still have a couple questions that need to be, um, conf a, a couple of answers we need from council and the moderator. So when do you want us to vote the warrant? Next week. Oh, so you're comfortable yeah, with- On the second. On the yep. second, yes. okay. Yep, so we yes. only need seven days. So. And so everybody um, knows, I wasn't able to see something about the change in the warrant posting, annual town meeting warrant posting changed between when I left before and when I came back. And so I had to get some clarification from the clerk and town council about that and then we will likely post the warrant on Thursday the 3rd, which is well within the seven day period required prior to annual town meeting. So uh, that's our already last, on your uh, agenda. So our last bit of um, information uh, or last item is to, um, to accept the um, resignation of the wastewater uh, operator for the town of Deerfield um, for Denison Hunt, which uh, we want to thank him very much for his service and I understand he's, he's moving on to um, out of the area. So we appreciate all his uh, efforts. And so I'll make a motion to accept the resignation of Denison Hunt from the wastewater treatment operator. I will second that. Any further discussion? All those in favor? I, Carolyn Ness. I, Trevor McDaniel. Um, so are, uh, is Kevin able to, this is very serious for us. Is Kevin able mm -hmm. to post this now, Casey? He's already it's, working on it. Yep. It's, our, it's already been posted on Bay State Roads. The um, things are going out probably tomorrow. Um, we had to clarify some, some salaries. We clarified that this afternoon. <clears throat> so that should be taken care of. Um, and Denison, you know, like you said, you know, we appreciate everything he's done um, years of service. And the reason why he's, he's just moving to the other side of the state is what it is, trying to be closer to the rest of his family and his girlfriend or whatever. So that is the decision he made. And, you know, it wasn't any other issues. So, yep. uh, you know, good luck to him. You know, he's, yep. he's a good guy. Absolutely. We're happy to have him. Yeah. Are, are you going to have luck with um, the posting? This is one of those jobs that there are a shortage of Kevin. Oh yeah, no, no idea. I mean, I'll be honest with you, last time that we did this, he fell into our lap, Denison. Um, and, and I mean, because we we posted, we posted, we posted. I mean, you know, we spent like four thousand dollars in newspaper article, you know, ads. Um, sure. you know, we're we're reaching out more because we're trying to utilize, you know, we can go in indeed. Um, we're trying to use like listserv, you know, that that they can go ahead and put it out to different different organizations again i've gone out to bay state roads um which is a lot of the the dpws in town or excuse me in the state and i also did mass highway for the people that don't pay attention to either one so i'm trying to nail them both um, i know i know you set up uh, mutual aid with um hatfield is that all sorted out completely no not yet we're okay. still we're still working through that okay so, you know, and it's going to be tough for the, for the other two guys that are left because, you know, yeah. they're going to be, they're going to be on basically five days and then, then it's going to be 12 days without a day off. Then it's going to be on for five days and then 12, you know, 12 days without a day off. So it's, it's going to be, they're going to be pulling their weight, no doubt about it. Um, they're going to be busy. We're going to need to look to, you know, with, with all the new equipment. I mean, that it, 
you know, it is going to have to expand at some point for personnel, for sure. Correct. I mean, because right now we're, we, by Massachusetts law, you're supposed to have a chief operator and a junior operator per plant. And we mm-hmm. have one chief operator that is overseeing both plants. Right. Um, we could really use an additional body for the simple fact of, of when something like this happens, you know, you can mm-hmm. split up the overtime a little bit easier. Um, and then when there is an issue, because there's always going to be vacations and sick days and bereavement sure. and personal days and, you know, a time that they're allowed to have off that you have to have coverage, which puts the pressure on the other two. And then like when we had the COVID, you know, there was, there was some issues that were down there and, you know, it, it was very difficult for the people trying to make everything still continually work, you know, because of the essential service of what they were. So, yeah. you know, they... You know, they, they pulled it through, they got through it. But like you said, Trevor, I mean, we, we are going, we need to look at, we are not at that point right now because of what it is, it still has to go in front of personnel. Personnel yeah. has to be able to go ahead and try and figure it out. Then it goes to the select board from the select board. Then it's going to go to annual town meeting to be able to go ahead and bring yeah. on an additional position. Um, right. yeah, so there's, it's a there's, planning thing as well. Yeah, there's a lot yeah. of things that need to go along, so. Um, but yeah, yeah, long story short is, is, is where we're going to try and just jam along as best as we can and, um, we'll get through it like we always do. Mm. Great. Um, Thanks, any other, Kevin. Dis- any other discussions for tonight? Hearing none, I'll take oh, a motion. Oh, to- actually we were supposed to discuss, um, this is, uh, item not anticipated. Um, Candace at the library wanted to know if she could have stricter, um, you know, uh, guidelines and what the state requires for the library. And before I tell her yes, I want to make sure that that was okay with you, Trevor. I didn't know uh, the state wasn't going to be here, but she, what, what, well, what she, wanted, to, she I mean, wanted to have, well, she wanted to have masks required at the library because they have a lot of children which are not vaccinated. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have sense. no way of, of, figuring out who is vaccinated and who isn't vaccinated really. And um, they also have um, a lot of immune um, compromised people, which even if they're vaccinated, the vaccines don't work as well for mm-hmm. the immune compromised persons. So um, I, I'm totally supportive of what she wanted to do, but we had voted as a board to um, you know go along with state guidelines. So I didn't know um, if you were, you know, if we should have some discussion um, about when do they plan to open up full time? Can we discuss uh, it on the second? Uh, well, sh- uh, apparently, uh, I guess next week. Uh, not we. It's too late to do it on the second. That's um, a comment from the Board of Health. That that's if the Board of Health wants to a, a, a point of. A, approve a reopening plan that may be a little stricter and i understand where she's coming from well i, I think that could I, be a more robust discussion well i didn't before i told her it, it was up to the board of trustees if they felt like they wanted to do that that was fine i felt like it was important to bring it up to the board mm-hmm. of health select board meeting tonight because they're going to make a decision before our next meeting on june 2nd well, I think it makes sense for to keep, keep the mask going in the meantime. I think we could, we should still discuss it and vote it with Dave here on, on the, on the second. Okay. All right. In the meantime, I'll, I'll, I'll convey what, to Candace that it's okay with us and that, um, but we will discuss it on the second. Okay. Yeah. No, that's fine. I just didn't feel we had just voted to follow the state guidelines. So I didn't want, I, I felt uncomfortable telling her, sure, go ahead. Right. Well, the all, some discussion. The, the one thing for me is that our children, you know, Deerfield seems to have a really high case load right now, and yes, we um, have eleven. And it's our children. Cases. Yes, and it's we have our 11, children. We have eleven yes. active cases this week, and and, the, and they're all kids, you know. So um, sure it, it makes me really nervous that people are are opening up and everyone feels free again, but our kids are the only ones that are not uh, protected at the moment. The ones under twelve. Um, and you know, I know a lot of kids um, go to the library, and it's a very tight spot. So it makes sense that 
if they wanted to have mass there. Yeah, so, okay. Well, we'll discuss it again on the second. All right, I'll, I'll convey this uh, discussion to Candace. All right, Great. thank you. Okay. Sorry, I'm I adding it to nope, the agenda worry. right now. Okay. Yep, thank you. All right, motion to adjourn. I will second that. All those in favor. Um, I, Carolyn. I, Trevor. Enjoy, everybody. Thank you so much for sticking it out for three hours. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> this was a long evening. And thank you, Anna Lee. You did a wonderful yes. job with the slides. You really did. It was robust <laughs> discussion. It was. Yes. Good discussion. And thank you, Jeff. Everybody that participated, yep. it was very nice. Yeah, very much. Thank you. Good Have night, a good everybody. Evening. Yep, you too. Bye. See you soon. Bye bye.